Good evening. I'd like to call to order the uh, Committee of a Whole for April 3rd. And if the clerk could please read the roll. Councilmember Wood? Here. Councilmember Garza? Here. Councilmember Hussein? Here. Councilmember Spatafor? Here. Councilmember Spitzley? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Present. Councilmember Brown? Here. Councilmember Cost? Here. Eight members present. And with that, we have uh, the minutes for March 27th. Council Member Spatafor. Madam Vice President, or Madam President, I move the minutes for March 27, 2023. We have the minutes for March uh, 27th. Are there any questions or concerns in the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. <clears throat> Before I open up this to, for public comment, I have a statement that I'd like to make. And then we will open it up for public comment, and then we will have uh, the different parties come down to the table um, to go over the questions and the information that we are seeking tonight. When I think of where we are today, I want to make it perfectly clear that all of us are culpable in this situation. Council the administration, EDP, and code compliance. And the reason I say that is um, because, first of all, council has passed budgets and approved staffing. We have passed ordinances and assumed that they were being upheld. And when I talk about the administration, what I mean is the different complaints and things that have been taken to the administration over the years, not only with this administration, but with the previous administration. And we did not see any uh, resolve to some of those problems. When I talk about um, the EDP, Economic Development um, Department, uh, I am talking about the previous administration there, which was Bob Johnson and Brian McGrain. And when I'm talking about code compliance, I'm talking about the manager who has uh, retired, and that's Scott Sanford. I have been working on neighborhood issues and code compliance issues for 35 years. During that 35 years, we have passed ordinances um, that dealt with drug and prostitution and houses and closing them down. We worked with Don Martin to close down blind pigs. We picketed in front of landlords' homes, not the houses that were um, tagged and causing problems because the neighborhood knew who those were. We went out to the landlords' properties so that their neighbors understood the type of person that owned property in the city of Lansing. We went before the legislature when the legislature wanted to change code compliance and have it from five to seven years for inspections. And we cried uh, loudly from the rafters, letting them know that that was not something that was acceptable for us in our community. What could happen in five to seven years made a huge impact on neighborhoods. We adopted the IPMC both with um, building as well as fire, electrical, and plumbing. 2018, we also passed an ordinance adding um, to the um, IPMC that required landlords uh, in order to get their certification to have uh, paid their property taxes or they would not receive their certification. When I look at the failures that have happened, there were ordinances that were passed that were never fulfilled by the people that were in charge that were supposed to make sure that those things happened. We had a culture that um, precipitated in code compliance to the point that during an election, a, the code manager stated in a 
meeting with his staff that we have another idiot running for council. When this became aware to both uh, then President Hussein and myself, we felt it was extremely important that this be turned over to the city attorney's office who turned it over to HR. When the person that was running, Ryan Cross, Koss, was elected, we went to the administration and insisted that there be, that that investigation be done by January 1st, so that when Ryan took office, that this would be behind him. That investigation wasn't done until February. When we put together the committees, we appointed Ryan to both the Public Safety Committee and City Operations. At that time, in talking with Vice President Garza, we made it clear to the administration that Scott Sanford would not be allowed to represent code compliance before council. Why did we make that decision? We made that decision because of the disrespect and how he was conducting himself. It was evident to us that that was not the type of response that we wanted before us in council. An investigation was held, and after the investigation, there were findings were given to then the new department interim director, Bart Kimmel, who then proceeded to deal with the situation. We were asked by the administration to bring um, Mr. Sanford back. And yes, I did say that if Scott Sanford was forced to come back to council, that I as president would cancel every public safety meeting as long as he was um, back there. The reason, again, was because of the blatant disrespect for this body. After consulting with the city attorney, we found out that his job description only indicated that he needed to give us reports. I reached out to both the chair of city operations and the chair of public safety, who both indicated that they did not want that individual in their committees. Tonight, as we listen to the um, constituents who come forward with their concerns, my goal for this council is to be looking at ways that we can solve the problem, meaningful ways that we can solve the problem. I know since this issue has been taken up by Ms. Kimmel and uh, Shelby Freyer, that they have worked diligently to try to come up with some solutions. Based on that, we need to be looking as we do our questioning on not necessarily putting blame, but how do we solve the problem? There has to be short-term, medium, and long-term resolutions to this. We cannot and I stress this, we cannot keep going backwards. We can't have such as Arbor Point, who when we boarded up that apartment complex because of all the issues that were there, to end up being another Autumn Ridge. These are not acceptable to us as council, to the citizens of, of this city, to the people that are desperately looking for housing. We have to make sure that the housing that they're going into is are ones that are safe, clean, and can be, um, and they can feel that it's someplace that they can call home. The idea that we have people that are living with cockroaches, bed bugs, rats, ceilings that are falling in on them, plumbing that they cannot use is unacceptable. So at this point, we will open this up for those in the audience that have comments. 
and if you would give us your name at the podium and you will have three minutes. Is there anyone that would like to address the council at this point? Good evening. Good evening. Mike Lynn, um, first I wanna address a couple real quick issues. I noticed that you guys named this the Red Tag Crisis, and crisis as I was watching 60 Minutes last night, and Alejandro Mayorkas talked about why he wouldn't name the issues at the border a crisis, and he said because we have a plan. So as long as we're working through our plan, we don't call it a crisis. Crisis is us waving our hands and running away from the situation. So that means we, do, we are in crisis. I imagine, I believe we pretty much are. So that's, that's the true definition of what we're into. Um, you talked about short-term, mid-term, and long-term plan. What we're finding in this situation, what you all are seeing is, and I pre appreciate you, Carol, for admitting that, and that's the first point of accountability I've heard from the city government in this city is that we're at fault. We've voted on things, we've, we've uh, appropriated budgets, and this is what we've come up with. Um, you've, you said that you guys have made ordinance and doing all these things, and I know that that to be true. Um, and then it's not being followed by the administration. And unfortunately, code compliance is under administration, and all their employees are. So if things are not being done by way of this, uh, this sketch here that kind of shows the direction on things go, you have to go up there. And I, I find it really disheartening that Scott Sanford is, is being thrown under the bus, and I'm, I'm not saying it's bad. Uh, he deserves everything that he's getting, but nobody's talking any higher than him, which is beyond me. I mean, even as we're taking blame and we're saying that administration and then you named yourself specifically in the council and then we named uh, all these other people from all these other directions, we didn't name Andy Shore. And if people, is, people continuously think that I have some personal vendetta, but I don't. I just understand government. I understand how a strong mayor is supposed to move. I understand that he is the CEO of the city and everything that works on the outside of this building, he is the boss of. So if it's not working, and we got all these different departments that have all these different problems, and we're not naming that as an issue in itself, is accountability. We don't get to this point over one year, two years, three years. We probably don't get to this point over five or six years. But it's just, it's not addressing the issue as it applies. Meaning, if Scott Sanford was so terrible as we're saying that he is today, where was the, where was the meetings? Where was the conversations? Where was, the, where was the accountability? Drag him in here, put him under oath, and ask, why is this stuff going the way it's going? Because these aren't new. These red tag situations aren't new. 2019, we were having the same exact discussion with the mayor. That's when our, 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 our Autumn Ridge popped up. And here we are again today, and Scott Sanford is left, and it's like, there's still no accountability to the people that allowed that behavior. As a supervisor, as a manager, if I allow somebody under me to do that type of uh, derelict of duty, it's on me ultimately. They're not going to go to the underperson. If a firefighter does something terrible, they're going to come to the chief if they just continue allowing that to happen. The chief is our mayor. You all can only make ordinances and send it through. Um, I just want to say real quickly, outside of that, that's your short-term plan. Long-term plan is to hold some accountability there. Um, HRCS, I see they're all here. I would love for you to hear from you all on what we're doing with their charge. Their charge got changed by a, uh, a city attorney opinion. I brought that paperwork to you all. I'd really love to know because this is not the time to take a charge away from a body that's a stopgap, especially with this administration. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Farhan Shikumar. Um, it's no secret that many families and neighborhoods are hurting. And this body and the mayor's office and the city attorney's office have decided to choose cruelty over compassion, harm over housing, profit over people, and backroom deals over transparency. The truth is, we come here every meeting telling you guys the problems that are facing this community, and you guys do not listen. It got as bad as where a toddler died in this city. A toddler died in this city, and that didn't even move you guys. No changes were made. Nobody was held accountable. So this conversation that we're having, is long overdue. That toddler, that tragedy, could have been prevented. We're having the same conversation over and over and over again. Long term, short term, medium term, 
we should have had those plans in place a long time ago. Because the problems that we're dealing with today didn't just happen overnight. It's been going on for years. And you guys have neglected us. As residents, you guys have neglected us. It doesn't matter. When people say they want change, they don't mean faces. We can have new city council members. People want change. People want policies, structural change, real change. That's not what we've been seeing here. It's a shame. It's a shame that things have gotten as bad as it has. Because all of this could have been prevented had the city council worked with the residents, as the mayor worked with the residents, as everybody, as if everybody had worked together, a lot of this could have been prevented. Look at this list. These are all the red tag properties in this city. Look at it. That's a lot of houses. And that means even if we hold these landlords accountable, that many people are going to be kicked out. What's the plan for that? Huh? Where are you guys going to put these people? We should have, we should have been had a trust fund where money was going towards for situations like this, emergency situations like this. Like this. It's sad. You know, I was born in a third world country. I was born in a refugee camp. And Lansing residents are being treated as third world citizens. Literally. We gotta do better. We have to do better. No more talking. We wanna see action. We want policies being changed and implemented. Lives are at stake. Wake up. Hello. So I just want to start off by saying something that I think that we should all know. Um, the oversight of any code compliance office absolutely is the duty of the mayor, his administration, and any city government, period. City governments, especially one like ours, um, which we all know is a literal strong mayor government, acts very much as you would a company that has a CEO, the CEO of the city. So when you have an office in which a Scott Sanford is allowed to exist and continue to exist consistently in the ways that create what we now have on our hands as a crisis, do we all just act as if he, he acted in a silo? He did not. And we know that this isn't something that happens overnight. So I just wanted to kind of point out, mm -hmm. with the mayor and the administration, they do the hiring, they do the firing, they do the enforcements. They're supposed to oversee the actual effectiveness of any person in their roles at a, as a city government employee. That clearly did not happen and that did not happen for an extremely long time. So any person such as Mr. Sanford, who is the person that's in the hot seat right now, is supposed to have oversight. So when code compliance as an entity, as an office, is not doing their job, the responsibility ultimately falls on the mayor and his administration. The last time I was here, I said it was about time that he has to sit in that seat and answer some questions. We have yet to see that. We have an opportunity right now for us to not allow another hire that is a friend or a favor or another coercion of power to be put in a position in which we don't have a capable person that has zero oversight in which something like this, their ineffectiveness at their job results in a crisis. Their ineffectiveness at their job in HR results in lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. Their ineffectiveness at their job results in us having a housing crisis in which the mayor just stated on record to the news, we don't have enough affordable housing to even place them. These are issues that do not happen overnight. So yes, do you all share some accountability? Absolutely. Do slumlords? Absolutely. But who has the power to hire, to fire, to conduct the oversight, to, to enforce policies, to divert resources? We know exactly who has that responsibility. It's time to hold that person and their administration accountable for once. Thank you.
Good evening, my name is Rosalind Williams and I've been at this podium multiple times. So first, thank you all for at least listening to me. Um, but the question was asked to me today and I had to ponder it based on the email I received. What has the city done for you? What can the city do for you? Um, <clears throat> backtrack, I am one of the residents that lives in Autumn Ridge. Well, no, I don't because my unit has been red tax since uh, February 24th. No heat, no gas, everything because they're not up to code. We've been living like that since 2019. So when asked what could the city do for me, they asked me had HRC reached out to me. Yes, they have. But I think they thought that I was someone that's on Section 8. I work a full-time job. I have a couple of businesses, so I make my own money. Unfortunately, HRC tried to make me feel stupid. Well, did you try Zillow? Did you do this? Did you do that? We are not in a position to be treating people like they're stupid because everybody should know their rights. And if they don't, we're, we should be in a position to teach. Um, as far as solutions are concerned, I've been asking for this list for a while now because I said, you know, I would do the research to find out what the code is, what they need done. I would help the city on my time to help bring this up to code. Hey, creating letters to say, we'll give you this if you're willing to give the city this. And in return, maybe even allow somebody to purchase this home if they're willing to equal it out. So that is a goal. You know, I know that Pontiac, Jackson, even as recent as Detroit is taking money out of their budgets to create affordable housing or create first time home buyers. So there are a lot of things that we can do, but we keep hitting the, oh, well, we can't do that. The government says this. The government says that. Well, as it stands right now, K North had about 24 families displaced. We already know Holmes Road, 26 families displaced. Technically, there's thousands of families in Autumn Ridge that should be displaced because we're pink tagged or red tagged. And as recent as a few days ago, I found out the owner that owns Holmes Road bought Risedale or Stonecrest. So again, you're going to have more families that are at risk. What are we doing? We're steady allowing these people to buy these properties, but putting people at risk. I mean, I don't know what else to say. I'm really, really discouraged. I'm angry. And then I'm, I'm an elected official where I have to sit and smile and say, it's okay, it's okay, when it's not okay. The good thing for me is I pray, I have a good support system, and I have friends that will help me, but everybody doesn't have this. And yes, the mayor should be here because I've asked him for a meeting one-on-one. -on -one. He looked at me and just nothing. HRC needs to be reevaluated. Start cutting the budget. Cut the budget. I mean, don't keep asking for money. If you can't prove anything, shut it down. And that's where it needs to be revamped at this point. Let's just be honest. That's my say on all of this. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? Good evening. My name is Elaine Wombo. Thank you, President Wood for making the statement before the meeting was opened up. Um, I really appreciate that you are all coming together to look into the problem, work effectively, to try and change and correct the housing problems in Lansing. This is not a new problem. When I first founded Rejuvenating South Lansing in 2015, we had the same problems. We've been working on this and working on it. The housing problems in Lansing of over 705 plus tagged properties or homes is a disgrace, not to mention the poor, insecure, I can't even imagine what is going on with the people living in those apartments. They've been paying rent. The property owners and management has been taking that money. Some of these people, and I've talked to some of them, they have children. They're afraid to say anything because they're working jobs, trying to get them to school, trying to keep them in an environment where at least there's a roof over their head. They're helpless because nobody's been listening to them. The time is now to make the property owners and the managements accountable for their neglect and not correcting the red tag issues that have been in front of them. 
The time is now to take aggressive measures to correct these problems. We are taxpayers. All the money that you're going to pay out to pay for the hotels and all the other things, it's our money. We support this entire city. We want actions. We've been demanding actions. Stick together now as a council and hold the mayor accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? Jody Washington, <laughs> excuse me, Carol, thank you so much for holding this special meeting. And thank you, council, for really trying to get some teeth in this problem. This did not happen overnight. It's been going on for years, and it's gotten only worse the last four to five years. I am horrified with all of the complaints that we gave to Andy Shore regarding Scott Sanford that the answer to what he was not doing was to give him a promotion. That is unconscionable. Um, I, I have had several meetings with Andy Shore, always only to hear, we're going to agree to disagree, and thank you very much, with nothing. I'm horrified that the HRCS department unilaterally, through an opinion from the city attorney, stripped away all duties of the HRCS advisory board that is in ordinance. I didn't know that the director could go to the city attorney and just change an ordinance and have it take effect immediately. So there you have another group of eyes that have been blinded without their consent. I also would say, <coughs> Having sat on that board, the duties included actually reaching out to people, investigating. Um, I was chastised for actually doing that. And I was told by the mayor, well, you're nothing but an advisory board. Thank you. I think with stripping everybody from their responsibilities, from their voice, to not following ordinances, we have created a crisis. I'm in these apartment buildings. I work with homeless people every single day. And I will tell you, because of this, and because our HRCS department abdicates everything to an outside agency, who now is putting these people into hotels, our homeless people that were in there are being asked to leave. So we now have several more people on the streets. And as far as affordable housing, somebody needs to go to the state and get ex exclusionary zoning outlawed. The reason we don't have enough affordable housing is because Lansing cannot do all of the affordable housing. We can't afford it. We can't sustain it. But every outside township has, has practiced exclusionary zoning, so they don't have to take those people. To me, that is nothing more than systemic racism that perpetuates generational poverty. So do what you got to do. Use your legislative power. Use what you have. You have the budget. You have the law. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council at this time? Thank you, Council, for having this special meeting. Thank you, Carol, for um, being open and honest, as always. Um, I, I'm appalled at, at the, the number of red tagged houses that we have and the properties that are out there. Some of you know that during Christmas, I was dealing with a situation with a family of six. The family of six, and I own my home, and I have enough bedrooms, so don't come after me, that I moved them into my home. Because I had a, a great-granddaughter cry because she thought Santa Claus wasn't going to know where she was living. And I watched what, what took place in that apartment complex. And to this day, there's still two families living there that never moved out and shame on whoever for all these apartment buildings to be having individuals 
paying rent. They're still paying out the money. And I've said it, and, and I've said it over again. I, Ryan has heard me say it so many times. I'm a broken record. They are making a living on human lives, and nothing is being done. And when you have an administration who says, well, I believe in my department heads and I stand by them, where you allowed this to, to go on for years. It didn't happen overnight. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council at this time? Belinda Fitzpatrick, um, 224 South Home Street and Post Office Box um, 20204. Yeah, my house is on this list. And my house was red tagged. And um, I think it was inappropriately red tagged. And I think that this is a city and a county issue. I'm looking forward to this um, case law in front of the Supreme Court of the United States about returning the um, surplus proceeds to the last property owner. Now, Alan Fox m referred to this as putting, um, returning the money in front of um, doing something about blight. But I've seen the red tag misused from the other perspective. And, and I, you know, I think there's a problem with having an individual who works for the county, who on Facebook has publicly said that they're managing 30 rental properties. And then I, I've heard that he bought 10 acres in an expensive area and that he has two Teslas. Now, you know, I kind of suspect in my case that there was a connection between somebody wanting to push my house into tax foreclosure and my house getting red tagged. Now, the one house I, I own outright, but the one that has a mortgage, the mortgage company has already started adding the $150 a month to my mortgage. But luckily for me, I decided to live below my means and um, I can fight having my house pushed into tax foreclosure. But I think this really needs to be investigated. I told Ryan Cost, this is not just a city issue. This is a county issue. Because if I end up suing, it's going to be against the county and against the city of Lansing under joint and several liability because animal control brought in code compliance. Animal control used a warrant that was, contained very, very many perjurous statements. And before my house was searched, code compliance should have went in and got another, um, warrant so i mean i can appreciate the people who are our renters but um thank you thank you is there anyone else that would like to address the council at this time seeing okay uh, reverend dr thomas woods part of the hrcs advisory board um, I'm really concerned about some of the things I've heard tonight. This problem has um, really been an issue with this city for a long time. I'm a housing administrator by trade. I've had to deal with situations like this since 1989 when we had problems with dilapidated housing, landlords not being able to keep up the units that they move people into. Et cetera, et cetera. And now we're having issues uh, with code compliance, possibly not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So we have to ask the question why is all of this going on? 
How is it that we got into this situation? And these are questions that we really, truly need to answer if we're going to be able to at least put a dent in these problems that we're having. This is a great city. I love this city. I'm very proud of this city. I was born in this city. Um, and I want people to know that when they come here that Lansing takes care of its own. That means we're going to be able to provide decent, clean, affordable housing, but we need to have proper oversight. Where did we lose that? What happened? I hear a lot of people talk about what we need to do, okay? And one way may not be better than the other, but one thing I know for sure in terms of dealing with issues, we gotta be able to come together and we have to be able to listen to one another and we got a formulated plan in which to attack this problem and stick with it. This is not the first time that I've come to a meeting and heard people talk about their issues with dilapidated housing problems in Lansing, et cetera, et cetera. We talk about it, everyone gets all jacked up and hey, we're gonna do something, then they forget about it. Everyone goes back to their own lives, something like that, but who winds up losing? the individuals who are in those dilapidated housing. We have to come up with a plan. We need to do something to move this forward because we have too many groups that are being blamed. The mayor is being blamed, HRCS is being blamed, co-compliance is being blamed, okay, fine. What can we do in order to move this forward, okay? And I'm, I'm asking, I'm begging you, and I'll do anything that I can to help move this forward. Just tell me what I need to do but we need to have a plan. Please help us come up with a plan and let's stick with it. The mayor needs to be involved and I kind of wish he was here in order to hear some of these issues because these are some valid concerns. There's some that I didn't point so valid, but that's, that's their opinion. But these are some valid concerns. We do have issues with housing in this, in this city. Let's attack it and let's attack it consistently. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council at this time? I would just like to reiterate that um, when people come to the dais and talk to us about those issues, even though we might not be responding to you, we have all reached out to different people in different departments and to the administration to try to come up with solutions and have been told that items were being worked on. Um, I also want to indicate that um, we had expected that there would be a representative from the mayor's office um, here this evening, and I had assumed that it would be Jane, who is not here from the mayor's office. We do have um, other department heads here, but we had uh, assumed that, um, that someone from his administration would be here to speak on his behalf as well. Um, at this time, if we could have the uh, members of EDP uh, and HRCS um, come up and take um, seats at the table. We have additional seats for... Thank you. Uh, yes, Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. I'll be brief, and um, I appreciate your words in the beginning. I, I just want to also mention that we also had an ad hoc committee on housing and resident safety last year and put forth several recommendations as well. And again, as the chair of that committee, I do accept the responsibility that I never followed up on those. But those, you know, that is how council speaks is through, you know, recommendations and resolutions. And so we did look at this problem and try to find resolutions, had a number of folks come in for public comment, had the departments in, and ultimately um, put forth um, we thought were appropriate resolutions. Some required budget issues and some required just department policies and procedures. And, and so that was just another tool that council used to try to um, look at the situation and provide recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, what we'd like to do is start going through the questions that were provided to you uh, by council members. If there is um, follow-up on those, those are in your packets. Um, the first one that we have is what is the process in which 
property is inspected, flagged, and eventually tagged. Good evening. You guys hear me okay? Yep. Thanks for having us. Um, I, I do want to say uh, thanks to the group for getting this organized, and, and we appreciate that this conversation is, is really going to be proactive. Um, I liked when you guys said work session and coming up with solutions. Uh, I do believe not one department is going to fix this issue on our own, and, and it takes all of us. So I appreciate you guys holding this, this session, and uh, we'll turn it over. We kind of have uh, a few of us set to speak to each one of these questions. So if there's, if there's any, please stop us if you guys need clarification, or we can provide any other information, but I'll, we'll get started here. Okay. Hi, I'm Barb Kimmel <clears throat> with the Development Office. Can you pull that just a little bit closer, Barb? Thanks. I sure can. Thank you. Hi, I'm Barb Kimmel. So how does a property become red tagged? A property could be red tagged for a variety of reasons, um, but typically a red tag is provided to a property because it is unsafe for occupancy. It has been deemed unsafe for occupancy. And there's a few criteria um, that- Barb, I'm gonna interrupt you. Sure. If, if it says, what is the process in which property is oh, inspected? In inspected flag. So okay. let's go first with inspected. Sure. And then flagged, which would be issues that have come up with it, and then eventually tagged. Sure, okay. So uh, there's a couple of different routes for inspection. Um, one would be for um, a rental certificate on the regular um, schedule for applying and, and receiving a, a rental certificate. So if, a, if it's time for your unit to be recertified and you pay your fee, then an inspector will come out and walk through your property and it's possible that they'll find violations um, basically a list of repairs that need to be made so that the unit is brought up to the housing code and um, after 30 days there will be a recheck and if those items are not taken care of um, then um, a lack of certificate or non-compliance would be sent and um, then typically if it could be tagged for being out of compliance. Um, also, there is another process, the safety process. In other words, if, if uh, code compliance receives a complaint, either from an occupant or for a neighbor about unsafe conditions, and then they could um, do an inspection to, to take a look and see what, what, um, what violations exist and then they would write up those violations. And if those violations were not taken care of, um, then there's a whole process for that. But, but, it, but generally, a red tag would not be applied unless the property is unsafe or if it, was, if it failed to comply for, for a longer period of time, then it might be tagged as unsafe. Or tagged as red. A couple of questions, mm -hmm. and then I'll take council members. But um, the inspection process, you said when a fee is paid, what is the average time? I can remember when it was almost a year before an inspection would be done from the time that um, the fee was paid. What is the turnaround time currently? So I'm not exactly sure what the average turnaround time is, but today I looked at one, and it was six months. Six months, okay. And then um, if a property is pink tagged because there were issues that, um, that were not complied with, is there any follow-up? If there's a tenant in it, is there any follow-up if that tenant leaves or um, to make sure that, because then it would be red tagged, if I'm not mistaken, if the tenant is no longer in there, then it becomes red tagged and you can't rent it. Is that correct? Yes, I believe that is correct. Okay. Is there any follow-up to, to make sure that the current tenant is still there and it's not a matter of bouncing tenants in and out? 
I'm not, to be honest with you, I, I don't think at this point that there is just at that point other than looking at the, um, the extensions, you know, so 30 days is the same tenant there, um, you know, like for a recheck, if you're going out for a recheck, is the same tenant there or is it vacant or maybe even is the inspector going to recognize that tenant as the same tenant or a different tenant because we don't get tenant information. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Thanks, Barb. Thanks, Shelby. Thanks, Director Coleman. Um, thanks, Joe, for being here. Um, I appreciate it. Question. So you said you, you talked about the process of, of properties inspected, flagged, or individually tagged. My question is this. So we, you have a home, and it's pink tagged. You go and you do the inspection, it's pink tagged. What is the average time that a follow-up inspection is conducted to make sure that that landlord is doing what they need to do. I can't answer that right now. I don't know. I'm not quite sure how to query the system to find that out. Okay. So is there? Thank you for that. So is there a? Um, there's not a process by which, um, you know, the pink tag is entered into the system and then it automatically kicks out a follow-up date for reinspection. I think that, that it does kick out a follow-up date of 30 days. But you don't know if that's done consistently. I think it is, but is the inspection done? That's what I mean. You right. Don't, yeah, okay, all right. Um, one of the things that we had uh, suggested in the ad hoc committee on housing and resident safety was a review of the rental inspection, of the rental fees, the rental license fees to make sure one, they're current with, at the time, 2023, but that they're, they're um, appropriate to be able to hire the necessary staff and or just conduct um, the services that we need to do to make sure you know, that we're doing the necessary follow-up. Do you know if that's happened or if that's in, 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 in the plans? It is in process, yes. We have, I have written the RFP and we are getting ready to send it out. It so, will go to purchasing and it'll be posted. Thank you, Barb. So you've just, you guys have just recently done that, then just started the process, and that's fine. I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, you've just started the process. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Council Member Hussein. Sure, and, uh, and, and trying to be solution oriented, I'm thinking about capacity within COVID. Uh, we, have, we, we have known this is an issue for quite some time. Um, and I think uh, culpability in terms of of council is that this type of meeting collectively has not happened earlier. I think respectively we've all advocated. I think come bunch of time we've advocated. I think, you know, obviously we've done a number of amendments to ordinances and things like that. We listen to recommendations from the. I think they want you to turn them off. Sorry, the we've meeting. implemented those uh, recommendations, but this meeting uh, absolutely should have happened quite some time ago. We know that. Um, but again, trying to be solution oriented when it comes to to code. Um, in my time uh, over the past eight years, we have built capacity within code from seven code officers to 11 districts. We built uh, capacity within premise inspection from two and a half to four. Uh, we even created a, a position, a funded position uh, for a commercial corridor inspector because what we were hearing from our code officers that were on the front lines is that we are being pulled out to, to essentially enforce code um, with regards to commercial properties and that's taking us away from doing inspections, uh, particularly when you're talking about multifamily dwellings. My question to you is, again, we are now at 11 four and one, when we were just eight years ago at seven, two and a half and zero. Um, based on what we are receiving annually, um, and, and I know you guys are studying all of this right now, um, what, when, when you think of 55,000 units and 50% of those are our rentals at this point, do we have enough code officers uh, in place? Uh, do revenues, annual revenues as an example, um, actually support uh, this idea of maybe even enhancing beyond the 11, uh, particularly when you think of what our code office um, actually has to enforce, which is above and beyond what other municipalities such as Grand Rapids have to enforce. We know that. Um, so are you guys, I mean, are we looking at that in terms of the capacity of code and whether or not we have appropriate numbers within code? Um, what I can say is that we are looking, right now we're having a problem because we can't really use the BSNA system to assess where we're at because we don't understand how to query it. And I did meet with one of the BSNA owners this afternoon and spent several hours with him. Um, and that really helped my skills. But we are still assessing 
some of the problems. We have a lot of inspections that are incomplete. We have a lot of properties that are out of compliance. We don't know the full extent of everything at this moment. Okay. So when we get to recommendations, there will be some recommendations. Let me ask you this as well. So, sure. So I'm, I'm thinking too, you guys obviously are going over the procedures, you're going over the policies. First of all, I want to know, and I don't want to get too far into additional questions, but I don't think I saw this on there. You guys are going over a policy review right now. Could you please tell me what that looks like? And what I mean, um, do we have internal people looking at that right now as an example, our term code compliance manager? Are we bringing in a contract employee uh, to review those with that individual? Or are we going to actually bring somebody in uh, that, we, that we deem um, uh, qualified, right, to run, this, to run this incredibly important shop and then actually allow them to review these policies and to give recommendations? What does that look like? Right. Because so much, it's, it's difficult to even talk about capacity. I know that um, when we have probably some flawed, flawed policies and procedures in place. Uh, and so at this point, that could potentially be throwing good money after bad, right? So it will be one of our recommendations that we um, bring in a consultant to take a look at the department from the top down and from the bottom up to figure out where our strengths are, where our weaknesses are, where we need assistance, where we need to put our energy in order to catch up. Um, we'll be making those recommendations. Okay, and then the last question pertaining to this. When we uh, red tag a unit, I, I think I kind of heard this question in there. Um, but not explicitly. When we red tag a unit, if we are displacing somebody because of that, what are we doing, particularly, you know, obviously we saw what happened with the SimTop case. What are we doing to ensure that the units that these people are moving into, because a lot of times what happens is an owner is just simply moving into uh, some other unit within their portfolio. What are we doing as a city to ensure that those properties they're moving them into are not tagged? Right. So we're learning. I'm learning. Shelby's learning, everybody's learning. One of, one of the things that we learned was that we actually need to ensure that these people are moving into properties if a landlord is going to relocate people and we're going to allow that to happen. We need to ensure that the unit that they're moving people into is safe, that it's not red tagged, that it's not pink tagged, that it's available for occupancy. So we will be implementing a process by which that will happen. So that if we end up va vacating a building like we did at 2222 West Holmes, um, those folks will first go into a hotel and then we will work with the, if the landlord is, is rehoming people, we will uh, review those units and make sure that they're not, that they're safe for occupancy. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. So, you know, I, I mentioned this last week about working in silos, right? So I get, you know, and, and maybe we'll get, it's probably on one of these questions, but I'm trying, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, we, we, we have an inspection, you have a pink tag property. Theoretically, we're supposed to come back within 30 days. I get that. So within that time it's pink tagged to the reinspection, theoretically 30 days, you have 30 days of uncertainty for that resident because mm -hmm. they don't know what the heck that pink tag means. Right. Right. When when the whole thing happened with Autumn Ridge um, and they were pink tagged initially, I know I got calls and I'm sure everybody else did because the landlord was telling them that they were going to be evicted. So what are we doing by way of, of education? And by the way, that was one of our recommendations for last year that when that First, when that pink tag happens, how do we, you know, what are we doing to provide some comfort to that resident, educate that resident of what their rights are so that they are not feeling that they're going to be um, evicted within the next 30 days? Right. So when I took over, one of the things that we implemented was that whenever a unit is pink tagged or red tagged, we provide certain information. The first piece of information is this flyer called Know Your Housing Rights. And this flyer has contact information for legal aid and HRCS. And it talks about um, what you can do as a tenant to protect yourself, um, how you can stop paying rent and escrow your funds in an, in an account if 
that is something that you feel that you might have to do. Um, so we give them that, and then. And I want to be. I want to be clear. Barb, sure. Mm -hmm. That's something that your your department has has developed. Your department has done that. Has has developed that flyer. That we didn't. Piece. We didn't develop the flyer. No, we didn't develop the flyer. Uh, HRCS actually developed the flyer. We okay. we worked with HRCS and the city attorney, okay. to to um, put the flyer together and make sure that it create contained correct information. Okay. Yep. And then we have two other HRCS developed flyers. You're welcome. That we also give out. One is a community resource guide, and the other one is a, um, a two-sided brochure called No Place to Go that that has information about community resources like meals, overnight shelters, legal assistance, picture identification, things like that. And those are just been those. And so that's the process going forward. And yes. you will be doing that. We are when, doing okay, it. Thank yep. you. We are doing it. Yep. Counts Officers okay. have these. Councilmember Brown. Thank you, President. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, the flyers uh, that, that you were just referring to, uh, when did this process start? Where, where that education being oh, provided? I'm trying to, it was shortly after I took over, after, after Brian McGrain left maybe a week after so rec very recently it was recent okay um, with all of the red and pink tags is that something that that we're mailing out to everybody or having as far as a link or something for all of the people that's been in this condition for quite some time no we haven't done that i that is that is something that we could do we could put it on our website it might be on hrcs's website as a matter of fact okay is it oh, on no hrcs's problem. website Okay, great. Direct to, to the individuals that are being affected since we have their addresses? We certainly could. Okay, uh, thank you. And then also uh, the BSNA software, is that the correct? Yes. Um, you said you guys are working through that uh, because you really don't know how to query, in other words, um, how uh, to look at the data to follow through with the processes that are in place in the ordinances. You're saying we really don't know how that works at this point. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're trying really hard. We have um, training scheduled for staff, both at staff that are users of the system and staff that are um, administrative users of the system that have more, more rights, rights to query, right to run reports, rights to see into the database and see the tables. Um, unfortunately, the earliest that we could schedule that training for was the end of April, April 25th, April 28th, and May 5th. Um, and so we've loudly protested and um, got a little bit of attention today. One of the former owners had came in and spent some time with me, showing me how to query, um, helping me learn how to operate the tables. And um, we also discovered just in that short period of time that we have some inconsistent data we're gonna have to sift through and figure out. So if, um, so how long we ha have we had the software for? I mean, I, I think it's been a long time. I feel like we've probably had this, this software for 20 years. Okay. Um, and, no, and nobody knows how to use it. Um, and so now everyone has to be trained. Uh, but in the meantime, it sounds like we're not able to really move forward effectively with looking at the red tags and, and the pink tags in the process. So is there um, immediate, like I know they came and trained you, but is there immediate where we need these reports? Can the, own, the owner company run these reports so we're able to, as a city, start addressing these? It's a possibility, yes. Have, yep. have that been in talk now, or is this just we're waiting until the training and then? Oh, no, 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 no. We're, we definitely don't want to wait. We want to get the information. The last several weeks have been extremely frustrating for me because I have not been able to crack this and haven't been able to get the assistance that I needed. So I was really happy today when we finally got some attention and uh, were able to get in. Well, hopefully we're able to cross train as we go forward. Thank you, Council President. That Thank I think you. is something that I wanna say that um, uh, cross training and succession planning are going to be at the top of the list in, in all of EDP. That was one of the things I was gonna hit on and I was gonna recommend to Jane, who has joined us at this point, um, that it doesn't matter what software we have in any department, there needs to make sure that everyone understands how to utilize that software um, so we're not in this position. 
The other thing that you might think about, um, Shelby and um, Barb, is we're looking at putting a million dollars into BSNA for finance. You might want to dangle that over their heads if they don't want to make sure that they're getting training to you in a sufficient amount of time. Appreciate that, and I'll sure use it. I would think so. The next question is, is there a written checklist that is published so that it shows what uh, you are checking for or inspecting as um, for code? So at this time, when a code inspector goes out, he takes notes and then he comes back to the office and creates a letter. I will tell you that we have been working to develop a checklist and the checklist is almost completed and we will be implementing that very soon. Uh, the checklist has actually been in the works, I found out, since 2020. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. So, and, and I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm asking the same question, Barb. I'm just trying to learn too, but, so there is not, so the inspector goes out, he does the inspection, he writes notes. There is not a requirement for a written report to be filed about that inspection? I mean, what happens after he comes back to the office? He comes back to the office and he utilizes the software, the BSNA software, to basically, it's kind of like a pick list. He'll, they will pick um, the violations, place, place those violations in a letter, and then the letter gets mailed to the owner and the tenant, and, and the letter says, these are the violations that you have to fix, and this is how long you have to do so but there's no actual record of the inspection, what was looked at, what wasn't looked Pictures at. Pictures or anything like photographs and stuff. Okay, thank you. There are some photographs. Sometimes okay. we see photos. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next is, is there any tracking of, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member um, Hussein. One, that's scary. Um, so I'm glad you guys looked at that. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm appalled, frankly. Um, a couple things. When I actually first read that question, um, I thought, and I'm not seeing it anywhere else, um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask the question. I thought we were actually talking about, because I would have never imagined um, that such a checklist didn't exist. Um, I thought we were actually talking about red tag monitoring fees. Right. And I actually thought we were talking about the discretion that some officers are able to show, uh, or I should say uh, execute when they're actually out in the field. When it comes to red tag monitoring, just very quickly, because again, I don't see it here, what are we doing differently now? Or what are we going to do differently um, than what we've done in the past? Because in the past, Barb, as you know, um, we've taken a look at properties um, that, for whatever reason, have went months and months and months without any type of monitoring fee. Yet there's really been nothing done um, on that particular home. And so we really have, we have this, this and potentially even appearance of impropriety, frankly, out there mm -hmm. um, with favoritism and things like that, but that that monitoring fee has not actually been assessed. The other That's piece right. is, we know that there's still a cost of doing business. If, if any one of our NEAT team members is out doing that 360 piece, looking for further deterioration, looking to determine whether or not there's uh, habitation, any of those types of things, um, that there's a cost for doing business. And the other piece is, a lot of times, it's the fee that moves the landlord in terms of actually doing something with that property. So what are we gonna do differently? Because when we look at the data, we are like blown away with all of the discrepancies and all the disparities. And I agree. I agree 100%. So one of the things one of the things that we're implementing is that properties that are red tagged that have that are past the in the neat team, properties that are in the neat team will be assessed regardless of whether a permit has been pulled and they will be assessed until the property is habitable. That's allowed and that's what we're going to do. Now, sometimes there is a situation if there's a fire and insurance is involved um, but those situations will be identified and they'll be monitored by the code enforcement manager. Okay, and then my only other question is when we, when we go out and we create the, generate this list of things um, that need to be fixed, um, what rises, I, I have a huge issue with sign and return forms. I have a real, real big issue with that. Um, with sign and return forms. Uh, so essentially, yeah, so essentially instead of going out and actually reinspecting every aspect, um, we're taking a lot of times these landlords. Um, that we're taking them at their word. Um, so, what are we doing with that? Um, what is the what is the rationale behind that? Um, it's it's a problem. Well, I think it, I think we see that it's a problem. Um, first of all, life safety things should never be included on a sign and return letter. Um, 
I think that we may find that we have the manpower to go out and do follow-up inspections and not rely on sign and returns, but then we might find that we do not. If we do not, then we'll be coming to you to make a determination as to what we want to do as a city. Do we, you know, so, so remember, we're still in the process of assessing what's going on in this department. If we find that we need to make changes, we're going to come to you and let you know. If we need to address those in a budget, then that's what we're going to do. I have um, Council Member Spadafore and then Council Member Koss. Thanks, President Wood. Uh, thanks, Barb, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, the qu a question I have kind of relates to what, what Adam's talking about. We assess these properties. We have these fees. Uh, I sit on the Operations Committee. We constantly assess fees to property owners that don't take care of the exterior of their home when we do the work. Uh, is there anything, maybe this is a, a gym question to research for later, is there anything that stops us from putting an ordinance that we're going to take care of some of, I mean, some of these repairs and then bill the owners and put it on their tax bill? It seems that the solution to a lot of these problems is creating more unhoused residents of citizens of the city, and that's not a good solution either. So is there a way that the city can step in and force these um, health and safety issues to be corrected beyond letters and fines that you're aware of? Um, I think the, the city attorney should should discuss that. As far as us, the city going in and making the repairs to these homes, you know, we don't own these homes. I'm not sure. I mean, there's legal issues, there's liability issues, there's all kind of issues. I'm going to defer to the city attorney. And Jim, I can't answer the question tonight. Uh, the, an the question is how do you enforce it? And you know, we do that all the time. You go into the court, you ask the court to take jurisdiction over the case, and the court orders these things to be done. That, I mean, that's how it gets enforced now. But there's no possibility of us contracting out work to get done. And contracting it out? I.e., like we do with um, oh, trash you mean we do the work? Well, not necessarily you, but like someone on behalf of the city. Well, um, that would be novel. Um, we could, we could. You mean do it and leave the people in the houses? Is that what you're suggesting? What I'm what I'm talking about is we get these issues that are sometimes ignored by the landlords, the folks that own the property, and then we create situations like 711 of them where uh, Barb just told us, and we've known this, that red tag means it's unsafe for occupancy. Before it gets to that point, there's obviously some some level of intervention that's needed and ignored by landlords. Is there a possibility that the city can do those repairs and build a landlord like we would if they left well, piles of we trash would, in the front lawn. We would have to get permission to go on private property and do that. That's why I'm suggesting that it's not difficult for us to file an action in the circuit court or any court and <clears throat> actually get a remedy within a matter of weeks okay. uh, where that can be ordered. Now, I think we've done that also in the district court. And we can do that through the civil infraction process or the complaint warrant thing. We have enough tools to do those types of things. But going on to private property and fixing it will need some type of You'd need some court order. administrative search warrant or something along those lines or a judge's order. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in funding as well. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, funding. Council Member Cost and then Council Member Switzley. Uh, thank you, President Wood. Um, Jim, I thought that we discussed at public safety at some point about the International Property Code um, when it came to red tags um, that we could go in as a city with, with a life safety issue after 72 hours and bring in our own contractors to fix the issue, but the problem was finding manpower to actually enforce that. Was, did I mishear that? I don't believe I was at that public safety committee to hear that, but if that's in the international property maintenance code, we have to go to a court to get an administrative search warrant to be able to go onto the property to do that type of thing. Uh, if it's an emergency situation for life, yes, we have all the remedies we yeah. need. We just need to get the facts. Okay. Um, go ahead. Nope, sorry. No, no, um, go ahead. My next question is, is for um, Barb. Um, now, I know that I took a look at the list that we got, um, and there's 
21 prop because we're talking about um, someone had mentioned something about the red tag process um, so 21 properties are over a decade old one is from 2003 um, so are we do we have a team that we've assembled to address these super old um, red tags that are are in this uh, report we do not at this time have a team we will be making that recommendation I also want to add too that some of this data as we mentioned um, we're not putting a lot of lot of stock into it I, I noticed there were potentially some duplicates and things on this list as well um, so I think um, you know we need to prioritize this list once we know we can trust the data that we're, we're getting out of BSNA I, well, the 2003 red tag, the red tag was there yesterday when I passed it. So that that is actually real. So it's still there. Yeah. 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 And clearly, someone's been living in that house past 20 years. Um, just one last thing, um, a frustration here. Um, you know, all of you have come here tonight uh, to to work with us and find solutions. Everybody at City Council's here. The mayor's chair is empty, and Jane. The deputy mayor didn't show up until 6:10, um, and they're asking taxpayers for over a million dollars in pay in that office. I'm a little disappointed. We need to be all in this together. Thank you, Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so, you're, you're, when we talk about what Councilmember Spadafore said, and and we we talked about this, you know. If we can go on someone's property, cut their grass, go on somebody's property, take their belongings, trash, whatever you call it, and then charge them four and five thousand dollars, and when they can't pay, put that on their taxes. We had this discussion last year in our um, ad hoc committee that, you know, what is to and, and this is how we got to looking at rental fees and looking at inspection fees and, and whether or not they're sufficient. You know, we also in the past have had contractors on um, a list of contractors because we had this program where we would go in and, and, and repair people's homes. So we, we have contractors available. I, I'm, still, I'm still questioning, you know, why we can't do what Councilmember Spadafore said, why, why you know, because we're trespassing when we go on somebody's property when we cut their grass. You know, nobody's letting us go on their, their property to cut their grass. Nobody's letting us go on their property to take their trash. As a matter of fact, a lot of people who come to government ops basically say some of the stuff that people took weren't trash. We've been in people's garages because the garage door was open. So we've been in someone's living space. So I'm, I'm, you know, and I, I continue to talk about this. I, I continue to say that we as a city, we should be able to do that. We should be able, and we should be able to when these, if we get to the point where we're red tagging and someone has to leave their house, the landlord should be paying for it. And I know we've had discussions about it, but they're doing it in a lot of communities in the state of Michigan. And so I will once again put those as part of our budget priorities and recommendations to the administration, but I, I, I am interested, and, 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 and Jim, you, you, you told us why that isn't the case in committee, so if you can talk to us right now and explain to us why we can't do, why we can't do the same thing we're doing with grass and trash, because we are entering people's property, um, I, I'd appreciate that, just so everybody can hear um, his response. Well, you, you know, the weed and trash and all that, it's open and obvious. Uh, it certainly is on the personal property, but you have an ordinance also that says that it's a violation, it's a criminal violation or a civil infraction, and you're going to ameliorate an emergency situation, one that harms the public health, safety, and welfare. Going onto a property where you actually go into the house, into the curtilage, um, and uh, uh, you know, hire contractors to work on property that's owned by someone else. I mean, you, you have big constitutional issues there without a warrant. And so we can always go and get a warrant. We can ask a warrant for a warrant from a judge to protect the city so we don't receive another lawsuit. What? Okay, please, please. 
what what I'd recommend at, at this <coughs> point is this is something I think you can have a further discussion yeah. in Apology. public safety. Apology. No, no, that's not a problem, and that that can be taken up um, there. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, President Wood. Um, thank you so so much. I'm, I'm very appreciative of the transparency. Very appreciative of the transparency. And then at the same time, as a result of that, it's very frightening to hear all of these different areas that did not um, get in the condition that they are overnight. Um, so my question would be, what are we looking at? I've never been a part of an entity that someone didn't get written up or you know, fired or something for some of this. I mean, these are people's lives. Um, so so is, has anyone, uh, what is, I guess, the process, administrative process? Do you have one as far as when people to hold employees, management, everyone accountable? Uh, because there's, I mean, this, this is eye-opening. Thank you. Well, I think we do have processes to hold employees accountable, absolutely. You need to, to follow those policies and procedures, and you need to implement those policies and procedures. So you might start with an evaluation and then um, you might follow that up with a, uh, a PIP, an improvement program, um, or an improvement plan, you know, to help coach an employee along. Um, you might follow that up with a counseling statement. Um, you might follow that up with with uh, written reprimand. Um, so what it, what it takes is the implementation. you have to follow the process and you have to follow through on the process. It's quite time consuming, but you have to make it a priority. Wow, thank you. So that's, and, that's oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Finish your question. Okay. Thank you, sorry about that, Compressor. Um, so have there been evaluations done over this time and what you guys are reviewing? No, um, the, the city has not done evaluations, actual employee evaluations in a very long time. I mean, gosh, it's probably been 15 years when um, uh, they decided they really didn't want to do evaluations anymore. And I can't tell you why that is, but one of the recommendations that will be made would be to uh, regularly evaluate code enforcement employees so no okay. city employees have been evaluated in the last approximately 15 years based on your account that's my knowledge thank you so okay. much thank you president wood you're welcome i i just want to let people know we've only gotten through um i'm now on to the third question so if we can make sure that the questions that we're asking um relate to the question that we're dealing with that that would be helpful and then if you would note your questions as we get down further we can um, talk about those as well mayor shore has joined us i just want to apologize for being late i was in my office on a call listening so i've heard just about all of it but i was on a call but i thought i would join you when the call ended and it did so thank you for the opportunity all right thank you um is there I would also ask that as these questions are being developed that you be more specific with the questions. I know we had a discussion about being able to go on private property and all that. I'd like to get more clarification to the questions and what was said at public safety because I wasn't there. So uh, okay. if that's possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, is I, there a tracking of the workload that uh, code um, is doing? <laughs> what I said was that we're we're working to learn how to query those types of things. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and also to set up a system whereby um, the workload is monitored by the code compliance manager. All right. Uh, the next question that we have is: uh, a month ago, there was no long-term plan. Is there? Um, now one in place and what is it okay so I'm just going to point out that two weeks ago we had a leadership change in code enforcement and uh, now we have an interim code enforcement manager who's been there about two weeks um, it, his name is Walter Allen he's been with the department for I think 23 years 
and he is dedicated to making change. And so we have, we have done the following. We've implemented the ordinance requiring that property taxes be paid prior to issuing a rental certificate. We've identified- And, oh. and how, who's doing that? Is the code officer? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we've identified and continue to identify policies and procedures that need to be implemented. We've identified training needs for BSNA that include setups for some of the queries that we're talking about um, for managing the department. Um, and those include inspection completions and neat fee assessment, among many, many others. Um, we've scheduled the training, as I said, for BSNA. We've reviewed the job description in preparation for posting the code enforcement manager position because right now we have an interim in that position. We have uh, written the RFP for the fee study for EDP in preparation for posting by purchasing on MITN and that will look at all fees of EDP, not just code enforcement. Um, we're working to identify a contract worker or a consultant that can come in with expertise and evaluate the department policies, procedures, and insist with, or assist with identifying all issues and make recommendations that we can adopt for solutions. We are also um, identifying the need for a structural change to the red tag and pink tag system. In my opinion, Pink tagging is ineffective as it keeps safe units oftentimes off of the market while contributing to the affordable housing crisis. So one of the things we'll be working with our consultant about is the practice of pink tagging unoccupied units when the, um, when the complex is not in compliance. That's meant to punish the landlord, but what happens is they just move people in anyways. So we're going to take a look at that. I, th I think um, there, you know, there are ways that we need to strengthen what we do without punishing the people that need housing. So um, instead, base, go ahead. Were you finished? I was just going to say, instead of a pink tag, a compliance uh, ticket should be issued by the code enforcement officer. I think we also need to um, work with the courts um, and, uh, you know, make sure that we can that they're on board and, and we need to enforce what we have. Okay. Um, with, with the uh, items that you have listed, if you could put together that along with a timeline mm -hmm. um, as to how you, you know, this is something that we want to have accomplished in three months. This is something that we want, if, if you would do that. Council yep. Member Spitzley. Oh, I'm then. not done. Can oh, I finish my yeah. list? Yeah, if you're not done, keep going. I just don't want to miss nope, anything nope. important. Okay. You got to roll. <laughs> so I think we also need to identify a strategy for Lansing to keep and demolish blighted homes pre-tax foreclosure auction instead of passing them on to the treasurer. Because what's happening is that we have some extremely blighted homes that are getting auctioned to people and they're either staying red tagged because they are beyond repair or they're being minimally rehabilitated and people are being allowed to live there and it's not creating a good situation. So I think we need to take a look at that. Um, and that's important. Um, we also need to identify or um, the need for monitoring code officers' productivity, we talked about that, um, and, and also possibly restructure their day so that they're doing field inspections. Right now, they have three hours a day in the office. They may not need three hours a day to spend in the office. Um, and then one of the things that we need to do, well, I think that's pertinent, we need to identify and remove duplicate red tags. There's at least 45 duplicate red tags on the list that we gave you. And we need to leave the old enforcements and remove the new enforcements. Um, so that's, those are our recommendations right now. And like I said, we want to bring in a consultant to, and that consultant will probably add more recommendations. Okay, thank you. I have Councilmember Spitzley and Councilmember Garza. Thank you, Madam President. So 
Um, Barb, you you said a lot um, that you'll be making recommendations and you'll be doing that. So what is what does that mean when you say you're going to be making recommendations? Who are you making recommendations to? You're going to come to council. I mean, who are you making recommendations right. to? I don't so, want to put words in your mouth. So so I think it depends on the recommendation. If it's something that we can implement, like policy and procedure, we're going to implement that. Um, if it's something that requires an ordinance change, then we're going to come to you. If there's something that we need to do to strengthen um, our position in the courts, then we're going to meet with the courts. Thank um, you. Yep, we're going to do what we need to do. Thank you. Council Member Garza. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, Barb, when you mentioned working with the courts, and this may be to Mr. Schmierka, what, what are we doing or what can we do to make sure that another Autumn Ridge doesn't take place? I mean, because those were red tagged in 2019, they're suing the city, now we're in litigation and nothing's being done. And like one of the uh, constituents out there spoke on uh, that lived there and had to move out of there. I mean, our hands are tied regarding, you know, a, a lawsuit. So what can we do to work with the courts to make sure that if we're starting to find these bad property owners, what, are, what can we do to prevent them from suing us and putting us in courts for three years and these people are still living in the bad situation they're in? Yes, Mr. City. Unfortunately, Attorney. litigation, and there's a, there's a lot to that question. Uh, litigation takes time. There's no question about it. When you're talking about Autumn Ridge, the city was sued for race discrimination, claiming that what the city was doing was a result of race discrimination. And that was filed in federal court. That process takes time. You know, you have to file motions, depositions, discovery, all that. There was a simultaneous action in the state court. So we had two lawsuits on there. Now, that doesn't stop us from inspecting and doing things. Um, they were claiming that the properties didn't need uh, repair, all that type of thing. It was just a discrimination action on the part of the city. Uh, we won the one in the federal court, and then the second one, the state court, was dismissed voluntarily. It, reinspections were done, and I don't know how many, but we have a number that are now being appealed in the administrative process uh, for Autumn Ridge. So that's where we are right now, and I think perhaps Barb can talk more specifically as to that. In this whole issue of red tags and housing, we have a many remedies that are out there. We could write tickets, we can write complaints and warrants for misdemeanors. Uh, we could go into, we can do big safe and demolish process. We can uh, go to the court like we're doing with uh, uh, this latest, uh, on the the, uh, uh, the housing that, uh, that we're doing right now. We can go and ask the court. The court can take jurisdiction We've done it with other cases in the district court. I mean, the remedies are there. We just need to have the facts. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, but I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, anybody can, can file a frivolous lawsuit, right? And, and drag their feet for years upon years, and these people are still living in these bad conditions. I'm asking, is there anything to do, anything we can do to prevent that from happening? Is there an ordinance we can put in place to make sure that you know, something like this doesn't get drug out for years upon years? Well, you're right. Anyone can go into court and make claims that something isn't right, like whether it's a discriminatory practice or whatever. And it's going to go into the system with all of its rules of court. And it will take a year or two years sometimes to get through that. Unless we go in, the city goes in under the court rules for temporary relief, things of that nature. We've done that in the district court. Or there's nothing to prevent administrative process, make safe or demolish while we're in the court. Okay, so it sounds like we have some tools in the toolbox that we can utilize. Yeah. Right. Hi. Yeah. Councilmember Hussein. But you have to be willing to take the tools out of the toolbox. And yes. apply what, 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 what I'll take it. What's very frustrating to me, Jim, is that in, you know, since you brought up SimTop, I, I cannot tell you how frustrated I am with that process. And, and I'm just using that as a microcosm of what's going on. Um, I met out on that property with Brian McGrain twice. I met out on that property with the late Bishop Maxwell once. 
Um, I implored last year in a brown bag meeting where it was just myself and the mayor um, for the administration to pull in SIBTAB um, and, and apply every single tool that we had in the toolbox because it wasn't just that property, but he was buying up properties all across the city um, and, and, and essentially um, leaving, you know what, in his wake, right? I mean, really, really horrid conditions. Every time we, every single time we bring these types of things to law or to the administration or we hear, we got the tools, yeah. we got the tools. Yeah. So why, so what's the issue? Why are we not applying them? Is it an issue that interdepartmentally folks aren't communicating? Is it an issue where maybe it's getting to law office and you're too, you're too lean? I'm, I'm gonna be frank, what's going on at Sycamore townhomes is absolutely disgusting. We, we talk about Autumn Ridge a lot, um, but what ha uh, let me give you an example. So back in, and I actually have a timeline here, and this is incredibly frustrating. So when we talk about Arbor Point, then it was Woodside, now it's Sycamore. Um, I actually have a timeline here, and, and to me, this is just, I mean, this is egregiously uh, bad. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you, yep. Council Member Hussein. Uh, City TV, what we're getting on the screens here is um, our bios. I don't know whether the live feed is still working um, for everyone or not. Thank you. So, so let me give you this timeline. So in May of 2022, we did an inspection on Sycamore. Um, when in July, there was zero work that had been done, zero. I know for a fact that code officers wanted to ping tag that property and they, or, or write tickets, right? Court ordered uh, compliance tickets. What happened instead was there was actually a meeting um, with law. And so then there was a meeting in, let's see. So there was actually a meeting in July, right? And there were all of these agreements that were, that were made. made. By December of 2022, not one of those agreements had been met. So our code officers, once again, and this, and this is the issue, is that we do have some good, I mean, incredibly good frontline workers that are trying to do really good things out in the field, and yet for whatever reason, they're meeting resistance when they're trying to apply the tools, or they're trying to get the, the folks that are responsible for applying the tools to actually apply the tools. So in any event, when they go back in December, again, nothing's been done. Um, and instead of allowing code, uh, to then go out there and to enforce the way that they can enforce, what happened was a nether meeting was established. This, that is an absolute example right there of us having the tools and us refusing to apply them. You were <clears throat> several times. We have to get the data and the request to do that. We have the remedies. We do it all the time. Uh, Who does the request need to come from? Is it the code officer? It is it, is it the director of EDP? Is it the compliance manager? Depending on what it is, if it's a building safety issue or code, yes, from them. They need to come and ask us to do something about a particular piece of property. And we have the tools. And we have the remedy. We could write a misdemeanor. We could write a civil infraction. We could uh, recommend that they start the process for make safe or demolish. We could do a nuisance action. I mean, we have these tools. There is nothing that uh, we say that we can't do with these these tools that we have. So, so let me ask you then, with auto, well, we need case, to have this request. Well, it, so I hope because what I'm hearing is that we have all the tools, but that your office isn't getting necessarily what it needs. So I'm hoping that you all, as a city attorney's uh, office, that you guys actually get out and you actually educate. Um, our departmental directors, um, you know, senior level management in terms of what it is that you all need to actually get out there and to enforce the tools that we have on the books. Um, when it comes to Autumn's Ridge, I am, it, it, I, I understand the pink tags had to be removed. I, I know that there were, there were a series of inspections that occurred back in December. I know that um, this particular property owner is uh, quite savvy. Uh, and so I know that, and this isn't necessarily typical, but a number of appeals were put forth before the bo building board of review. I also know um, that that individual did not um, uh, submit those in a, appropriate form, right? Uh, so that individual has some period of time now uh, to put it in appropriate form, put it back before the building board of review. I mean, it's an incredibly long process. That being said, in the meantime, at least as I understand it, none of those units are actually certified. Yet as early as, or recently as this afternoon, he was signing leases. Yep. So why are we not out prosecuting I, I, We have raised this leases? issue with others. We, we don't issue the rental certificates. Others have to re issue them. And, and so we're aware that that is not happening. But it's a violation of the law. 
to be renting without a certificate. Carol, we don't write warrants for assault battery or anything else unless the police give us the facts and ask us to do something. We need to have that come to us. That has not come to us. I've heard that, what you just said, Mr. Um, Mr. Hussein, but uh, nobody has requested that we do anything on that. So, so what it sounds like, uh, Jim, is that our office can work with your shop to figure out what specifics that you need for our code folks to be able to document the right report to get it to your shop. So that, that's something we can, we can set exactly. up. Exactly. Great. Wait, did you want to, okay. No. Okay. I'm just going to say that we got the information that we needed up to the OCA for um, 2222 West Holmes. Uh, we did that in a timely manner and we got good results. I think that uh, the department has to be committed to holding landlords accountable. Well, again, go, going back to the experience that, that I've had, and I'm sure Jim's gonna tell me you can't do that today, but Mark Smith was a prime example of a, a landlord um, that was preying on, on people. Um, we took him to court ordered um, compliance and when he didn't fulfill that, Judge um, Beverly Nettles Nickerson ordered him to sell all of his properties and he did it. Um, Next is um, how many employees are at code and define their different roles. So currently there's 21 code employees. We have a manager uh, who's an interim. We have um, a uh, lead housing manager. We have 10 code enforcement officers. Nine of those positions are filled and one is vacant. Um, we have four premise officer positions, three are occupied, one is now vacant, that, that gentleman just left last week. Um, we have three principal clerks, um, and we have one administrative assistant that does billing and assists with make safe and demolish. Okay. Council Member Hussein. So the nature of those roles, it, it bothers me a little bit for I, I know we are down now to nine districts, um, and I think that's totally inappropriate, frankly. And so when we talk about solutions, again, we need to take a look at these districts, the number of dwellings in each one of these districts, and the fact that we decided to, as an example, um, take one of those districts, collapse it, and, and create a floater position for an individual that hasn't been, frankly, in the office for about a year now, uh, makes zero sense to me. Um, and then the other piece is, what we also did is we created uh, more, uh, the, the shop became more top heavy. Uh, so instead of 11 districts, we now, my understanding is have nine. We have one floater. We created another position uh, for, um, um, I don't know the, the exact term, a housing inspector. We put Walter Allen in that. And so you're continuing to take people out of the field um, and you're in, in continuing to increase the number of dwellings um, that, these, that, that these code officers are, are responsible for. The other piece is, I don't know that there's, um, what's the word, not equity, but I, I, don't, I don't know that there's a balance between each district. Um, as an example, you have code officers in South Lansing um, where we have uh, quite a bit, right, um, there's, there's quite a prevalence of multifamily housing um, and there's quite a bit of density in terms of rental um, and you have people operating in those districts and then you have some that are um, north of 496 as an example um, and the units, at least I believe, from what I, from what I can tell, um, the, the number of rental dwellings um, is not even close, right, to what that one maybe district officer is responsible for in South Lansing. So what I'd like to see too um, is, is us consider the number of districts, the number of dwellings that is appropriate for each code officer, um, and then making sure that the, the, the number of doors essentially they're responsible for um, is that there's some balance to that. That can definitely be done. Okay, our next question is do we track city cars to ensure that their um, safety and that that uh, these properties are inspected? Sure. So vehicle maintenance is tracked by mileage, which is entered when the user fills up their gas tank. And when vehicles require maintenance, an email is sent to that individual who is assigned to the car. And if there's no response, then the supervisor of that 
employees notified. And then for incidentals such as flat tires or service engine lights, the employee will um, email fleet services to schedule an appointment. Um, Currently, there are no outstanding maintenance or service issues with code enforcement vehicles, so I want to let you know that. Um, I will let you know also that there are only about six EDP cars that have GPS installed, so we need to work with public service to get the balance installed and working. Okay, I, Council Member Spitzley, I think her yes. question was... I yeah. mean, I, I, I appreciate what you just said, but I'm hoping that this question was was is, is supposed to be a little different meaning you know how do we know that the inspectors are actually going to the homes and actually performing the inspections that's what i'm hoping that this question was and so when you mentioned gps right. and that you were going to be installing gps in the cars that pretty much answered my question but that's what i think the intent of this question was yeah. council member garza Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Spitzley, because that's kind of my question. I mean, have you looked into getting like low jack services? Because I know certain contractors use that for their employees' vehicles to make sure that they're not going home, you know, or not, you know, somewhere where they shouldn't be. Um, the reason I've had a personal experience happen where there was a couch sitting on somebody's lawn and it was, you know, uh, ping tagged and, and then uh, I followed up with the code enforcement officer because it was never re removed on the day it was supposed to be removed. And uh, that code enforcement officer says, oh yeah, I drove by and it was removed. Well, it was never, it was never removed. So, I mean, when you get close out issues from Lansing Connect, um, it, that tells me that somebody's not doing their job, you know, and they're just trying to fill out the work order as it's completed and it hasn't been. So has there been a talk of maybe potentially uh, installing LoJack and if that- I've never heard of that. Okay, I do Lojack know that- LoJack is like a, um, it's a, a GPS, so you know where your vehicle is at all times. Right. Public so, service has those. Yeah. Yes, yes, and that's that's what I'm talking about. There's only about six EDP vehicles right now that, that are working with that system, and we need to get the rest All right. working. Thank you. Uh, next question, have there been any tickets that have been written against landlords on red tag? I don't know, Jim, whether that's... I, I didn't <clears throat> check on any history of this. We have the ability to write tickets. We can hold a pro property owner for a misdemeanor. We could hold a tenant for a misdemeanor if the tenant knows. Uh, but I don't have that data. I don't know if they, you have that in code. I don't have that data right now. Okay. I don't know if that's something that's possible to pull out of BSNA. We're still struggling with BSNA. Patricia. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. I would hope, okay, I would hope that we are not ticketing tenants um, for, for this. This is a landlord and city of Lansing issue. If a tenant is living in a red tagged house and they don't have anywhere to go, I hope we're not ticketing them. What we need to be doing is having folks come to them and try to help them find housing. And so as we look at that, um, you know, we really need to, it needs to be process oriented. It does not, it cannot be punitive against the, the tenant, the person that's renting there and may not have any other place to go. Um, Mr. City Attorney. May I address uh, two questions? The number one, not having the data. We have four courtrooms that we prosecute in two full days a week. We do everything on misdemeanor traffic, you name it. So we don't keep records of every, when a, when a case comes in from building, whether it be a red tag or whatever, there's a, either a ticket or it's a complaint, we process it. And then the prosecutors go to court and prosecute. We don't keep records all that without having to dig for it. Now, on the second issue, as, as prosecutors, we exercise discretion. We have to look at all the facts. If there is a tenant that doesn't know that a property is red tagged, that's something we would not write, okay? We just wouldn't do it. But if it's a situation where the tenant knows and is carrying off the red tag, then we have a different matter there, okay? But the owners are the focus. Councilmember Jackson. 
Thank you. Just a few things. So I guess if that's the case, even if they do know a tenant who's probably or supposed to be paying rent to the landlord who's responsible, then you should never probably ticket them. Um, but also, we are fighting against basically capitalism. And we live in a society where conditions make money and having it and not having it so important and even rewards ownership of property. And that's a problem. Um, but are we thinking if the goal is for the landlords to comply, can we think of also possibilities of how to make it easier for the landlords to comply instead of having to build our defenses and our offenses up to go after? Because it's always not as cut and dry. And I think that displacement should be the absolute last thing because I can't speak for, I can only imagine having to be displaced because where I live is red tagged not to any fault of my own. And then, because you guys are saying, work with them to find housing, but the reality is there is no housing, or there's very limited amounts. So really you're telling them to um, possibly be homeless or work in shelters, or take a week of a hotel and hope that something else works. So it should be, it seems like it should be life or death as far as displacement and, um, because there's a difference between electrical issues where there could be a fire and having a clogged ease trough where it wasn't taken out quick enough and it's a lack of certificate, which is different than safety sometimes. And there's dozens on here that's a lack of certificate, which doesn't necessarily mean it's like a, a livable safety issue. It means that something didn't get fixed on time, um, which also brings me to a point that the lack of contractors in the area and handy people that can actually do work on this is prohibitive for a lot of people. I don't know about the big corporations, but for a lot of other people, um, there's a lack of people to do work, which would just cause delay, for example, in getting a certificate um, or having some things fixed. Again, there's a difference between electrical and there's a difference between plumbing. One should make people possibly have to leave the house because it's not safe and go through trying to find housing. And the one, I think people can still live, depending on what it is, but still have the red tag process going on. So- Councilman Jackson, we, I am not aware of one ticket that we have written against a tenant. Right, and I'm just saying- I would have been- We shouldn't. Know. That's good, yeah, if that's it, how you gotta it, do it. That would have been brought to my attention. We have not written that. And uh, the, when we got the question, it was a theoretical answer. The owner is liable for a misdemeanor. You know, the tenant actually under the IPMC is also, but we are not going to write anything against the tenant unless there's some egregious conduct. Yeah, thank you. But um, that's just my thoughts as we go on. Okay. Um, our next question, and I think we somewhat answered this and how does a property become red tagged situation and what does that mean for the landlord uh, the tenant or owner occupied resident in a case um, as the case might uh, dictate <laughs> thank you yes so um, in a typical in a typical situation where um, a property is red tagged, it would be because the unit has been declared unfit and there's a five or six um, uh, criteria that would, that, that would fall under if it's being red tagged for a, a safety issue. And that would be unsafe structures, unsafe equipment, um, structure unfit for human occupancy, an unlawful structure, and then dangerous structures. Um, it also seems that we are tagging properties for lack of compliance, and that is where I think we need to explore other options. Okay. Um, our next question is, um, how many properties 
um, are pink tagged and have not had a follow-up inspection? I can't tell you how many properties have not had a follow-up inspection, but I can tell you that currently 329 units in Lansing are pink tagged. Okay. Uh, next, um, how many properties are red tagged and have not um, had a follow-up inspection? I can't tell you how many have not had a follow-up inspection. Um, I believe there's 698 properties that are red tagged as of uh, March 31st. 98? No. Um, 698. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see, the next is um, how many red tag units, how many units are red tag because of a lack of rental certificates? So I can tell you 126 addresses are red tagged due to the lack of certificates. I can't tell you how many units that is right now. I will learn to query that and I will provide you with that information. Vice President Garza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know I've asked you this before, and I, I asked Brian McGreen this before, and I know that you were interim, and I know Shelby is now, but have we put any procedures in place to make sure, so we're tracking our rental certificates to make sure that, you know, we are actually following up and getting the money that's due, and, and then therefore finding out if there's any issues with the homes? How are we working on getting an, an active list of who is certified and who is out of compliance. Oh, we can we can query who's certified and who's out of compliance. Well, I, I made that question. I, I asked that before, and, and the answer was no. We don't know. We we don't well, have we a can, way of tracking it. Yeah, we can look up and see who's certified, and we can look up and see if a unit is certified or if it's not. So, are are, are you guys actively doing that now? Because I brought this up to the mayor a while ago, and he responded and addressed it to me but about it was actually about the Simtom properties and they bought and they, I heard that they were currently out of uh, their rental certificates were expired and, and some for years so I guess what I'm what I'm asking is how how are we following up and making sure that those rental certificates don't go out of ex, uh, don't expire so when rental certificates expire then a letter goes out and we a letter is automatically generated and um, it goes to the property owner and says, it's time for you to re-up your certificate. And then there's a whole process after that where they are supposed to send in a check and then um, we schedule the inspection. And then um, if the inspection requires repairs, then we have to go through and make sure that those are repairs are completed prior to issuing the certificate. Okay, well that's, that's, that's I appreciate that, I guess, that would be trusting every landlord that they're going to send in the check. So who is following up from your department to make sure that um, after that letter is sent out to that uh, renter or that the owner of that property, who's following up to make sure that they're actually paying that fee and that that, cert that rental certificate is valid? Right. So, so I know that we gave you guys a list of properties. If you look on that list, you will see that there is um, – some properties are, are noted as lack of certificate um, and, and a lack of certificate could be in place for a period of time and once that landlord does not comply, then we would issue a um, failure to comply letter and um, once the failure to comply goes out, then at that point, our recourse is to pink tag vacant units. Um, it's not a very effective 
way well, to do this. So is there, has there been talks then to, since that isn't very effective, maybe up the, the rental fee for out of compliance? So one of the things that we're doing is a fee study, so yes. Mm -hmm. I think that, that we really need to revamp the whole entire system at this point, and that's one of the reasons why I want to bring in a consultant. I unfortunately am not an expert in code compliance. But yes, we do need to. I agree with you 100%. We need to look at everything. Thank you. But I think the one telling thing, I've got council members specifically then council member Jackson. One telling thing is I as a property owner can pay my inspection fee and have tenants in there and it can be six months later before you inspect. And during that six months, they could be living in a property that's not up to code. Council member Spitzley. You said exactly what I was going to say. Okay. I mean, you know, and, and I know you guys have already heard it, and I'm going to say it ad nauseum. You know, you've got, you, if you have a rental inspection and there are deficiencies like smoke detectors and there's no mechanism to follow up, bad things happen. And so the question is, and I think it's, it's part and parcel of the whole thing that you're talking about is that when you, when you go, we, we, we cannot rely on the buddy system anymore or, the, or the, the honor system where we do this rental inspection and we say, landlord, you need to install smoke detectors throughout the house and you know trust that they're going to do it because we've seen tragically and I've seen personally, that doesn't happen. And so we've got to, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to step it up and go back within 30 days and not six months particularly if families are living there. Because after that, that's on us. You know, we're, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And so that's, that's I don't know how we fix that, but we, we can't rely on the honor system anymore because it's not working. Well, one of the things that we can do is to say, not everything can be a sign and return. There are some things that we will accept a sign and return for, but there are some things that we will not accept a sign and return for. Okay, I have got Council Member Jackson and Council Member Brown. Just when we talked about the fee review, it made me think of something that I've heard where good landlords say that Lansing is prohibitive to do business and own and rent, and then therefore we would get bad landlords, and the good landlords say that the, the fees, but also the property taxes for non-homestead or rental property is so high compared to other places. So. I'm sure when they do the fee study, they're going to look at all that. But it's just one thing because there's a difference between fees versus penalties. I agree, penalties can be stiff and punitive and all that. But again, when we go back to capitalism, it's still these businesses have to have money to make the repairs and hire people and do the work and buy the materials. It's not like they're all just so rich where they can just, they're just like holding back their money and don't want to make. Repairs. I'm not talking about necessarily the huge ones, but there's a lot of, I'm just saying when we look at the fee, look at whether it sends people away that would otherwise be good landlords. Um, so so the, the fees will be based on the cost to administer. That's what the fees will be based on. Council Member Brown. Thank you, President Wood. Uh, my question was kind of a follow-up to what uh, Councilman Garza as well as uh, Councilman Spitzley um, with the pink tag, red tag. Uh, with that whole process, uh, are we tracking how many people as a result of that inefficiency have been displaced and become homeless? Because we're saying we have a homeless crisis and there's so many challenges. Are we adding to that? Uh, and, and if we are, which I believe based on what I've, the testimony I've heard today, we are um, kind of what is the process that's that's taking place or how are we supporting people um you know um instead of you know really putting them on the street right exactly i think that's a question for hrcs and we've been working together to establish some policies and procedures and uh resources we have some further questions down here for hrcs i think we can um, have that with that one if that's okay council member brown absolutely can i ask him one question related? sure are you i guess for your department are you guys tracking how many people you know end up getting displaced as far as you mean like every day through, or every week through the, yeah yeah not at this time okay thank you 
Thank you, Council President. Not a problem. Um, let's see, the next question is, why are vouchered people placed in red tagged and pink tagged properties and who's checking? And I think this goes from some of the um, issues with 222 West Homes. Right, yep, that, that definitely was a problem where the landlord of um, Simtab uh, wanted to rehouse folks and there were, I believe, six households that he was going to place in units that were pink tagged. So those folks are now hoteled. And we're trying to find housing from them. The COC um, is trying to find permanent housing for them. So, it, you know, in the future, we're using 222 West Homes as an example. That's right. But in, in the future, if you're moving people out, you know, you were there when people were moving out. What will and, we do? And you were yep. talking to the mm -hmm. property owner. Yep. And they give you an address. Are you, is someone then following up to see whether that particular yes. address, yes. is that part of the process in the future? Yes, yep, that's one of the things that we talked about with HRCS is that if we're, if, if and when, it's, it's a matter of time. When we have uh, a multi-unit that we need to do this again, um, we will hotel everyone and then we will make sure that the units they're going to are safe before they're thrust into chaos because it was extremely chaotic and there were a lot of lessons learned. And we realize, I think everybody realizes how traumatic that experience was for the people who lived in those units and it was extremely difficult to, to see it. It was extremely difficult to do it. It was not anything that anybody took lightly. Um, our next question is, why is HRCS not helping people to find housing instead of paying thousands of dollars when they could cover first and last month's rent at a fraction of the cost? And welcome. We appreciate the fact that you've sat there through a number of questions, and now it's your turn. Good evening, council members. Um, it is my pleasure to be here, as I strongly believe that uh, keeping people safe is all of our responsibility. So we're going to do our best. Is the green light on, Kim? Uh, yep. Green light's on. Do I need okay. to get closer? Yeah. All Thank right. You. How about that? That's much better. All right. And as I was saying, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, as I strongly believe that keeping people safe is all of our responsibility. And HRCS is going to do their best to pull their part in this. Um, with me is Joe uh, McDonald, who's our housing ombudsman, and then to the right of me is, I'm sorry, and to the right of me is Tony Young, uh, who is our contract manager administrator. Uh, they will also uh, pitch in if need be to uh, respond to questions. Your, your first question with regard to our uh, paying thousands of dollars in hotels when they could cover first and last month rent at a fraction of the cost. We would like nothing better than to do just that, and that is to put people in stable housing. However, we are currently challenged with a 38% increase in rent since 2018. Homelessness has increased across the country by 35%. Rent has increased um, significantly by 38, wait a minute. Rent's increased by 38% um, and homelessness across the country by 35%. And according to HUD, we are about 8,000 uh, affordable units shy of being able to meet our need. So with that said, I also want to add that we've learned from Lansing Housing Commission that every day someone's voucher expires because there are no options for them in terms of finding suitable housing. Um, people are being pushed out of their homes due to increased rent, and landowners or homeowners are renting affordable housing to those people with modest means, while those people who are not able to afford are being pushed out into the street. Many living in house and living in cars, others setting up tents somewhere else, couch surfing, living in abandoned buildings. So there's no place to put them. And rather than to have them out on the street, I would much rather have them in a hotel room. 
Council Member Clough. Thank you, President Wood. I, I just want to make a statement here. You know, um, <clears throat> I heard affordable housing again. I have a list of affordable houses right here. We've been told we have a toolbox to use it, but somehow it's got chains around it and a lock. So, I mean, what are we doing here? We've got affordable housing. This is, this is the frustration. I've sat here for two hours now, and we've heard we have a toolbox. Um, we have some really great ideas, but that's the same ideas we heard two months ago. So, you know, I just, I don't understand why we're not here talking about solutions to this, working together. We're just talking about ideas we've been talking about for two months, probably longer. So, it's, you know, that's all I have, thanks. Council Member Brown. Uh, and then Council Member Jackson. Thank you, I concur with Council um, and Cause. Thank you for your statement. Um, I was wondering how how much are we paying per uh, for the hotel room per month? It varies anywhere between sixty and seventy dollars a night. So that's about eighteen to twenty one hundred dollars per month. Could be. Yes. Do you have a system in place where you have people if they do need first and last month's rent? Um, you know, to get into a place that is available. We haven't talked about that. What happens then because $2,000 a month is a really, really nice place in Lansing. Um, I don't disagree with you. Uh, yes, there are options out there for them to acquire first and last month's rent. Uh, we may help some and so might the HARA, all depending on whether or not they meet the qualifications for HARA. Have you all worked with, um, I guess, market rate apartments that are less than $2,100 a month? Because if we're saying that there's not a lot of options and we're spending $2,100, that's market rate plus, I believe. All I can tell you is housing is not available for the people who can afford it, who can't afford it, the people that we targeted or the people that have come to us and asked for assistance, the people that are out there on the street. So we can talk about market rate, but most of them cannot afford market rate. And so they are doing the best they can with securing the housing that's available. I understand what you're saying. Maybe let me rephrase the question. For example, if we have an apartment at um, Lansing Apartments, mm -hmm. and the, it's a three bedroom, mm -hmm. two bath, and it is $1,300 a month, mm -hmm. not 2100 The hotels, I've had several complaints from several families. It's you know one or two bed. We've all been in a hotel room. Mm -hmm. And they have kids, a whole family, and there's no rooms. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to contract out, I guess, hotels at 2100 mm -hmm. we why not have, a, you know, if we're contracting to a marketplace that has three bedroom, two bath, and they say, okay, we're going to take 10 units and we'll only charge the city 1100 mm -hmm. Now we're doubling our capacity to house people in market mm -hmm. rate that is up to code, mm -hmm. you know, versus some of these hotels at astronomical cost is what, mm -hmm. what I'm hearing. Yeah, I like the idea, Councilman, and I would relish the opportunity to work with such a landlord. But we don't have that going on right now. Have you reached out to any? or? It's one of the things strategy? that uh, uh, Public Safety suggested to our housing ombudsman at our last meeting. And we talked about creating a vacancy, a vacancy bank uh, with landlords so that uh, we would reach out to landlords and see if there's an opportunity to let individuals secure housing in one of their dwellings until such time that other housing became available or until such time that they determined that they could remain there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, Council Member um, Jackson, Spitzley, and Hussein. Just two things I was thinking because we're trying to find solutions. The first is, even though this is a solution we can't even talk about because of red tape, but 2100 to house somebody in a hotel would probably be more than enough, well, at least a contributing factor to fix some of the things that need done. But I know that's impossible. Mm -hmm. And Jim will tell me all the reasons why, I'm sure. The other thing is, is I've had, we've heard Barb come before us. We talk about affordable housing with various projects. And everybody explained the reason why we needed some of these affordable units that were going to house multiple families and you know two rooms various things like that because there's a need out there and that was one of the reasons why i voted for it i understand brownfield and all these different things and people have their different reasons but 
when we need to add units, that's one way to do it is to add units when the time comes up. So um, even if it was a building that the city or HRCS or somebody had some rooms available for this type of situation, it's going to be more room. So it's just part of the solution that we are all looking for. I wonder if it is to look at that affordable housing and use money wisely. I've got Council Member Spitzley, Council Member Hussein. Since the door was opened and following up on Council Member Costs about these red tags, you know, and I wonder how many people are displaced because of these red tags. That's the first thing. We do have an affordable housing problem. And I don't care what anybody says, the studies show we need more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean, right? I know, you know, I hear, you know, that we're warehousing poverty and we're doing whatever, but if I live in Lansing, I don't wanna go to Hazlitt. I don't wanna go to Grand Ledge. I wanna stay in Lansing where my family is. It's our responsibility here in town to make sure we have clean, safe, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And it's the responsibility of us here, the administration, council, and everybody else to look at this city and make a plan on how we're going to achieve this. Part of that is you wouldn't, you know, and, and, and let's, 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 let's be clear here. These are market rate houses here on this list, okay? 98%, these are market rate houses right here that folks are living in that are red tagged and substandard. So that gets back to the tools that we have to have in our toolbox. We need to step up our game, okay? And, and make sure these people are held accountable. But we also need more affordable housing. Once we have more clean, safe, affordable housing and these people have options, these landlords are gonna step up as well. The problem is right now, to get that housing two, two and a half, three years, we're already behind the eight ball. And so that's where the crisis is, is that we've let it get to this point now, and it's all of us, myself included, to now where if we even started today and said we want clean, safe, affordable housing, it's three, four years before that can actually come into place. I'm not saying every, you know, every corner we should do this. We need a plan. And there's nothing wrong with looking at our city from a holistic point of view and saying these are where the deficiencies are and, and, and putting that out so that if somebody wants to come in and wants to invest in the city of Lansing, they can. We need a plan. We as the city need to look at our city and say, we, need, we, we decide we're gonna need clean, safe, affordable housing. We're gonna go out, we're gonna look at it, and then we're gonna champion it. And that's been the problem in the past. Barb, you can't bring us stuff here, and, and, and it's not your fault, it is what it is. You can't bring us stuff here to the, to the council for approval, and, and it's not championed. And that's the first time I hear, hear about it, is when you bring it in, and it's not championed by the administration. That's working in those silos that we keep talking about. We all need to be a part of this. We need to have a plan of how we're gonna fix this affordable housing thing, but it starts here. It starts with making sure these people are held accountable. These are market rate, these are market rate living spaces. This is not, this is not affordable housing. This is market rate. And, and they're substandard because these people have nowhere else to go. And then we red tag them, they're on the street because we don't have clean, safe, affordable housing for them to go to. So part of the, that's, that, that has to be part of your plan and part of your strategy, it has to be. Councilmember Hussein, then Councilmember Brown. Uh, um, just a quick question, Joe. So we did a couple weeks ago um, to you bring up this idea of reaching out to the Landlords Association um, and speaking in general, right, with landlords about uh, the, this potential of a vacant unit bank um, or potentially even creating a list of landlords that would be, you know, willing to be part of uh, like a rapid rehousing uh, program. Um, that was two weeks ago. What work have you done uh, since that time? <clears throat> well, I do have a, I'm on the agenda for the next Landlords Association meeting, so I intend to talk to the landlords about it then. Uh, the, um, uh, 
And so, yeah, that's that's where we're at as far as you know, trying to get on their agenda, getting on their agenda. Um, the uh, there is a you know our rapid rehousing is part of our continuum of care, uh, and they uh, are charged with trying to rapidly get people rehoused that may have had some unfortunate circumstance that caused them to be homeless, and so uh, that is a duty that they that they take on for our community. Okay, and then another question I have, and, and I, I don't want to bleed into the next question, but I'm, I'm going to ask you. When you are the housing ombudsman, so when a, and we've had some conversations of public safety, but I think it needs to be had um, here in the chambers as part of a broader uh, conversation. So when a unit is, is red tag, um, are you, so I, I saw the, the fancy flyers and, and that's fantastic. Um, do you actually, historically, have you actually went out there, particularly when we have, we have a property like 2222 West Holmes where we have um, significant displacement, are you actually out there boots on the ground supporting these individuals and in, in doing everything you possibly can to connect them to resources, not, not handing them a flyer, I mean you truly, you being out there um, to mitigate the chance that they're, they're going to be shelterless? Beyond that, if that hasn't happened, what are we going to do to change that? What, what's the plan moving forward? So <clears throat> that's what we were talking about, public safety committee, how we were going to address that. Uh, historically, that has not happened. The red tagging, the pink tagging has been not in our, in our bailiwick. So, uh, and every day we have a crisis, that's what, you know, our, our, what our focus has been. Uh, some of them heart-wrenching, uh, the situations that we encounter. So trying to keep people housed. So uh, in the future, what the plan is, is when we discover that a place is red tagged and occupied, then we will make, uh, make contact with them. And so that's what we did at uh, West Holmes, and that's what we're gonna be doing uh, going forward in the future as well. Okay, so I think of public safety two weeks ago, one of the things we talked about, and, and Ryan did an incredible amount of work out in the field um, to essentially, I mean, hand deliver you all um, the information you needed to go out in the field and, and actually mitigate some of the issues. Something that you said two weeks ago, you said that you were going to, with our social worker, um, actually start to prioritize the properties in the first ward. Um, I think there was you know, some 50% uh, of those red tag units that he had brought forward that um, we still believe were occupied, that you all were going to go out in the field and you were going to make contact. Has that happened? No, it hasn't. Uh, LPD is the idea was that we were going to coordinate with LPD social workers, and they uh, wanted to put a hold on that because of some of the, they needed more clear information about the houses they were going to. So that there was gonna be a process that LPD was going to identify which houses were gonna be, which houses were, are occupied, and that, you know, to issue warrants or whatever that process was gonna entail. But before anybody, I mean, that's our goal, not to make sure anybody gets a ticket or a misdemeanor that's living there. There's a reason why they're living there. They have no, no place else to go. So uh, that was what the plan was, was that uh, LPD social workers and myself were gonna go engage with those residents. Uh, they, you know, they wanted to put a hold on until they got more clear information. So that's the best I can offer. And I, and I guess that's, that's my concern here, is that you know, what I'm hearing is we have this, we have this, we have this idea, we have this tool, we have, you know, back to Ryan's earlier comments. It, really what we don't have, unfortunately, across the board, in my opinion, um, and I don't know how you fix this, we don't have the fire in the belly for, in my opinion, for this work. We don't have the, ur we don't treat these matters with the urgency they absolutely deserve. For, for us to be waiting on information for two weeks, I, I had heard nothing about that. If there's anything we can do to help, I was, I was assuming because of what you all told us two weeks ago, uh, that you were out in the field and you all were doing that work. I am really struggling. You know, it, to be frank, and this isn't about you, Joe, but about the position, I have yet to hear what we're getting right out of that position in terms of 40 hours a, a week worth of work. And the only thing, because we've asked and we've asked, and we, I had some of the same concerns about the citizen advocate, um, to, be, to be quite frank. Because when we first contemplated these positions or we had heard about these positions and we approved funding for these positions, I thought we were really going to see people out there in the field advocating, holding people's hands, helping them walk through the process, not just referring them, not just giving them a flyer, not just giving them a number that they can call that they could have found online. Um, 
it, the we're almost to the point where the only thing we can do as council, or at least I personally can do when this budget comes, the budget is before us, but when we actually start doing this work, is to just start looking at those personnel line items and reducing, frankly, um, those line items by the cost, or whatever that cost is for that particular position, um, to, to make it clear that we expect results out of these positions. I just, I, I cannot wrap my mind around what some of these folks are doing in the field. And frankly, I think there's some people at the top, they don't know what they're doing. And that's a problem. Um, so, so I struggle with that. Um, Autumn's Ridge, you know, I, I, was, I was, to be frank, when I went out to um, 1317 Kalamazoo, or I was bothered. I was bothered by the fact that I wasn't tripping all over individuals from HRCS, um, that I wasn't tripping over Joe Yu, um, that I was after working a 50 hour, it always kills me when people talk about how hard they're working. Um, I, I put 50 hours a, a weekend in my other job, and then I'm still out in the field, and I'm not seeing anybody. I'm not seeing anybody that should be there doing actual, the actual work, so that bothers me. So again, that's back to the urgency piece. Um, what about Autumn's Ridge? Have we went out and made contact um, with the folks at Autumn's Ridge? Have we been doing everything we possibly can to guide them? What about the people that have now been displaced? Because we did, my understanding is red tag 26 of those units, is that correct, back in December? Uh, we have Rosalind Williams in the back. My understanding is that she has been living in a hotel uh, for quite some time now and at, at her own expense. What are we doing to make that right? Anything? <clears throat> well, thank you for that assessment, uh, council member. Uh, every day from 8 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock at night, our phones are ringing. There are crises every day. I have 15 open cases of eviction diversion folks I'm helping right now, in addition to the phone calls that I get that I have to prioritize, phone calls, emails, and uh, online submissions into our office of what is an emergency and what is not. And so there are emergencies that we are dealing with on an everyday basis. So trying to keep people housed is our top priority. Okay. Uh, can we... Real quick, with regards to Autumn's Ridge, can you answer that question? What have we done? Uh, have you made, spe I mean, specifically, have you worked with Rosalind as an example? Yes. Um, you have hand in hand. You've worked with her. Yeah, we've spoken with her. Mm -hmm. You've spoken with her. Yes. But what? But, and that's what I'm trying to. I'm trying to get an understanding. We can't recommend. We can't continue to support and budget. We can't if we don't know what that means. Um, so I guess my question is, and it, again, we certainly can't recommend changes so that we can continue to support a position in the budget. Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, in speaking with Rosalind? Yeah. Okay, well, first. What was the action? I'll, I'll say that she has my, my boss's direct line phone number, so she's talked to her. Uh, I've talked to her. Uh, we've tried to direct her to different resources where she might be able to find housing. Uh, we don't do placement. That is not something we do in our department. We don't do placement, okay, because everybody's got different tastes, everybody's got different wants, and what they can afford. So that's not something that we do. So uh, I have talked to her. I've talked to her about her rights and responsibilities, what she can do uh, as a tenant. And so we've helped guide her through that process. And if I'm not mistaken, Joe, I believe you also were looking for apartments on her behalf as well online. You and I talked about that. We've gone back and forth on how we could help Roslyn. We've offered to, to uh, help her with hoteling. Uh, Joe and the HRCS staff are on it every day. And we get calls constantly, as he indicated to you, and our crisis didn't just start two weeks ago. And we've been dealing with crisis for the last year with and regard so to housing. Have we. So I have know, we. and I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from anybody, but I just don't want Councilman Hussein to get the impression that nothing's happening because there is some, a lot of things that are happening within our office. I work with the agencies, I work with individuals, we're trying our best to keep people from losing their housing. We, there are 1,800, the last I heard, pending evictions in the courts. We're waiting to get a hold of some of those and see if we can help. So we have been trying our best to keep people housed. Are you done, Councilmember Hussein? Before I turn it over to Councilmember Brown, I just want to follow up quickly with Councilmember Hussein's questions. Um, I believe we started the issues with Autumn Bridge in 2019, is that correct? And you were before the Public Safety Committee back then when we had, meaning Joe, 
when we had a number of the tenants come in. We implored you to have a neighborhood meeting out there and to discuss with them the possibility of um, escrowing their rent and, and all of those things. Did that ever happen? Uh, no, we were advised not to get involved with that. Oh, Lord have mercy. Yes, my okay, soul. I'm just telling you, we were advised not to get involved with that with the ongoing lawsuit. This was before the lawsuit. 200 and, 2019 was before the lawsuit. Uh, I can't recall the dates, but uh, we I was prepared to do that. I would love to do that uh, because it's an important thing that for people to know is their rights and responsibilities. I helped create the flyer to make sure people do know their rights and, res and responsibilities. It's an easy way to get that. I can't be everywhere, so that's an easy way to try to communicate. But we asked you to do that back then, too. Uh, in 2019, we asked you to do it in the housing ad hoc committee when um, when we had that. So this isn't the first time. That's right, and it's always a legal concern. I've asked legal services the same thing. If they would do us a favor and help draft that, now we HRCS is paying as part of the grant money for legal services. So if we're not getting help from them, why are we giving them city dollars? No, they're, they help. They, they assist. Uh, part of the information that we have for this uh, legal uh, rights brochure came from them. And I appreciate the Office of City Attorney helping us to draft that and put it together as to form to make sure that it comports with what's legally what we can tell people. Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Um, Real quick, um, to where Councilman Hussein started about, like we were talking about housing, you said the COC is doing the rapid rehousing, but we were talking about solutions that the city could provide, and then you said that they're providing it. Working with constituents myself, I know that there's um, limited per month requirements. So for example, if you're one person and you need rapid rehousing, they might pay 700, but the landlord might be charging 850, so they won't put them there. So when we're talking about there's no housing available, instead of paying maybe 2100 for a hotel, if we pay the other $150 that wasn't covered, then the landlord would be willing to rent to the individuals. Um, so is that uh, type of thing taking place or when, when it's talking about rapid rehousing? I believe, and Tony can maybe correct me on this, but I believe all those are uh, dictated by uh, fair market rent. And so, but Tony would be the more of an expert on what it, it, Okay, I'm sorry. No, that's correct, Joe. Um, fair market rent is what dictates what you're allowed to pay out of grants. Um, but your point is well taken that there are ways to supplement that. If we wanted to take that forward, we could work with them. Thank you, um, Tony. With the uh, HARA and see if there's a way we could supplement some of the rent. Yeah, so we probably Because we, we know that FMR, I'm sorry, fair market rent doesn't keep up with um, the, the current rates, that thank it comes you. along behind a lot of times. So. Yes, thank you so much. So there's probably hundreds of houses available for that. Um, constituents have come to me and it just, it puts me in tears because they have families. And the hotel program, not only is it expensive, but also you can't, you don't have ability to cook or have a, you know, if you have a three or four person family to even eat dinner together. So it's really putting someone in trauma and transient. Um, additionally, when we're talking about affordable housing, I think sometimes going to all the neighborhoods throughout the city, we have two different definitions. Um, so I know that affordable housing, um, there's kind of a term affordable housing, which is like a low income and subsidized units. And then there's being affordable as housing. And so I think in Lansing, we have affordable housing that's called fair market. And so I think that we need to expand housing that is fair market, as well as making sure those that need supplements are available as well. But the challenge that I see um, in working with so many constituents and, and being a community servant is that we're also not investing in economic opportunity. We're not investing in fully supporting small business, which creates um, opportunity and um, income to be able to afford places to live. We're not supporting uh, enough um, entrepreneurship uh, to help people who have dreams and visions and goals that can create um, something for uh, whether it's a service or a product that improves our community and also can be profitable for them and their family, uh, as well as um, 
really looking at, you know, when we talk about a plan is how do we look at uplifting and increasing the quality of life of everybody in Lansing and just providing housing for people if we're saying that they don't, they can't afford it and there's no uh, support, well, we have to look and, and, and get a bigger viewpoint and say, well, how can we uh, help people move forward? I've never heard us talk at the city about um, helping people with jobs or workforce development training and those type of things. And I think it's very important if we are truly going to uplift Lansing is to have a comprehensive multi-dimensional approach and bring all pieces to the puzzle that make a difference in our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have Councilmember Garza and then Councilmember Hussein. Thank you, Madam President. All right, so we're going round and round here, and I appreciate that, um, you know, we talked about accountability and that there really isn't a, a, a way to track, you know, what each department's doing, if they're performing or not performing. So, and, and I apologize, but I don't apologize. You know, Mr. McDonald, I've sent you multiple emails over the years, and I don't think you ever once responded. Kim Coleman, you have, and I appreciate that. But, and I understand it's the administration's policy to not necessarily have to respond to council. However, we were all elected by the people. We're trying to do a job working together, and we're doing this right now. We're trying to find out solutions of the bigger problem. But I'm hoping that as we're seeing that the communication's not being lost, you know, Adams one know what you're doing, and, and everybody who does, you know, frankly, when there's no communication back, and I understand that you don't have to communicate back to council. It makes it a harder for us. It makes it harder for the residents in Lansing. And I'm hoping that as we're having this discussion, this tough discussion, that we can potentially, you know, start working a little bit better with council and, and, and for the people of Lansing. That's all I have to say. Well, I look forward to that. I appreciate that comment. Um, and I hope that uh, you can feel comfortable knowing that any one of the uh, folks you've sent to me, I've worked on their case. So you, I might not have communicated directly back to you because we have a line of commu communication, which is my boss. And so I, I just ask that folks kind of respect that, that if you want to uh, you know, get something in my ear or to my attention, that it goes to my boss. Because when I have uh, a myriad of different people I'm working with every day, I can't, I mean, it just makes it so the work stream is much more efficient. And, and I appreciate that. However, like, like Councilman Hussein says, I mean, we all have day jobs, you know, we're all working here, you know, we all have 50 plus hour day jobs and we're trying to stay on top of these emails. You know, I was away last week with my family, but I'm still following up with my emails, making sure that, you know, my con constituents' voices aren't, you know, are being heard. Mm -hmm. So. I guess I don't really have too much sympathy when someone says how busy they are or their workload is because we all have multiple jobs. Oh, yeah. Council Member Hussein. Yeah, and so this is kind of the, you know, getting back to the, you know, are we operating in silos? Do we need to break some of that down um, and work, you know, both smarter and harder. I heard you say you can't be all places at all times. You're absolutely right. Um, but we do have folks out in the field at all times, right, during, at least during the workday. So are we, are we, is there any cross training as an example with HRCS? Are we doing semi-annual training with code compliance? Are we, to talk about the different programs, uh, to talk about the different um, uh, resources that are out there, uh, tell, and, I'm, and I'm talking, are you actually working with, not departmental directors, but are you actually working with our code compliance officers that are actually out in the field making contact with people every single day to empower them, to educate them so that they can then be out uh, supporting and scaffolding people. Yes, uh, so I've attended the uh, their staff meetings. Uh, they all have my information. Not only do you guys forward, you know, constituents to me, but they're also. I mean, they're they're running into folks in distress, and that's where that communication starts. Uh, is that they uh, will refer to folks to me all the time on uh, whether it's red tag or somebody they come into out in the field, come into contact with. Uh, and were you going to add something else? I can't remember. Can't remember. Well, it might may not have been as relevant, uh, con uh, Councilman Hussein, but I was just going to add that uh, Brian McGrain and I set up scheduling quarterly meetings with our staff, um, and the intent there was to make sure that we all knew what the other one was doing, that we shared information about each one's department, we did share training, we did a number of things. So it may not be specifically the, what's, what you were talking about, but yes, we do have that kind of relationship and have had. 
Okay. And then one other thing for, uh, it just again, as we're talking about silos, one of the things, and we did talk about this in public safety, we had talked about, actually, there was an effort. Uh, there was a, uh, an actual effort to create some measure of kind of this umbrella leadership so that you didn't have building safety and you didn't have co-compliance operating in, in complete silos and not knowing what the other shop was doing. Um, I know that there was some bucking of that uh, by some folks that are no longer here. Um, are we looking to, because we constantly are hearing from code officers and folks from uh, that are in building safety and clerical workers and the like, um, that these silos are a huge problem uh, in terms of communicating, in terms of moving issues um, out in the field to make sure that we have appropriate housing stock. Are we looking at that model again um, now that some folks are gone? Um, are we looking at re-implementing that? Uh, where are we at with that? What model is it that you're referring to? And, and I saw Shelby shaking her head, so I think Shelby knows what I'm talking about. There was actually an effort we were going to have. We actually brought Steve Swan in. Uh, and Steve Swan um, was supposed to be kind of, at least this is my understanding, the mayor certainly could speak, he's at the, at the dais. Um, there was supposed to be some measure of this umbrella leadership, right? Uh, but my understanding is we had some folks that were, that found themselves beneath Steve. Uh, frankly, on the totem pole um, that bucked that and filed grievances and everything else. Uh, so where are we at potentially re-implementing that, or, or are we just not able to? Wait, Shelby, Shelby's been working on this, so. Yeah, so, uh, so since I've been out here now, um, just shy of a month, um, you know, it's clear that we um, don't have the right policies and things in place to kind of run the place effectively, and I think everybody here would agree that we can, we can do some strengthening in that department. Um, I think the oversight part of each of our, our management right now uh, could be supported by potentially a deputy in that department. We went back and forth on whether we wanted to divide up the area and have an enforcement wing versus kind of the proactive building safety development side. Um, but then there's, again, that concern about splitting people up and creating yet another silo. And does it make sense to add, you know, a deputy to support those managers and, and these types of issues? Um, certainly, you know, hiring a, an expert on code to go through and develop the right policies for us to follow is going to be, you know, priority number one for us right now to make sure that we're doing the things we're supposed to be doing consistently. Um, but again, adding some, some more structure to help um, support those managers with training, with follow-up, making sure that we're not losing sight of, of kind of the end goals here. So um, that, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, unfortunately, there, there's no one way to do this. I mean, we could we could divide it up into five separate departments, right? There's just there's not one quick answer for this. But I, I think to start adding that that support uh, for those managers would be a good good step in the right direction. Um, and after you know a period of time, we can reevaluate and see if that still makes sense or if we want to go back to dividing up the department. But right now. Um, because they're, they're so um, intertwined, I, I'm not comfortable just dividing it up right now. Um, I do think that there, um, there has been kind of a, a, re, a rejuvenation of communication out there. I know since um, Barb and I have been there, we've been having weekly staff meetings with the management team. Um, I'm not sure how often that team had been meeting in the past, but sharing things like, hey, this new development's coming or this, this thing's happening, you know, we heard it at Cabinet, that type of information. Um, and it has already improved, I think, uh, each, each management section knowing what's going on and what projects we've got coming. Um, so I think just simple things like staff meetings are really helpful to share that information. So uh, we're trying to do all of those things to kind of develop the right uh, communication tools and keep everybody in the loop. I'll add in. Um we, oh, go ahead. we when Steve was there, this is this is what we had discussed doing, um, whether it was going at a, a, a director deputy um, that kind of each of them have a chance to look at different parts and work together. We looked at dividing the, the department, um, and we looked at that again when Shelby came in. We had a good conversation with council leadership, um, and we listened to their opinions. And uh, so this is this is where we're going towards uh, in terms of having um, having Barb having someone else out there, in essence, working to coordinate between building safety, code compliance, development, planning, and zoning, and parking. There are five departments that are interrelated that, like Shelby said, could all be their own department, but all have pieces of each other. So whether it's a compliance or whether it's development, these are all pieces that are working together. And I think um, Shelby and Barb have done a good job trying to, to get a hold of this, and, and we hope to have that new system in place pretty soon, but again, it'll be flexible because if it doesn't work, then we'll readjust. Let, last thing, and I apologize. Um, one of the things you, you talked about going back to, I think it's, it's it, critical. When we talk about the policy review uh, and we look at um, top-down, again, review, and we look at uh, recommendations and implementation, um, you said that uh, in terms of the consultant that we're going to have an expert. 
one of the things, and maybe this would be just being anticipatory and maybe me um, having some measure of fear that's, that's completely unfounded, um, I really hope what we don't do is bring somebody back um, that has essentially uh, been brought up through um, a system that we now hear has really historically not had any policies, not had any clear procedures, um, and it's just really been yeah, run I can, in a disastrous way. I can assure you way. that that's not okay. the, the plan right okay. now. I think, um, and even from just my, my personal opinion, having an outside opinion with the experts that enforce this code, uh, that know the books and how other cities do it, probably would be good for us to learn. Okay. Um, now that being said, I, I think our, our last talk was really putting out an RFP or seeing who we might be able to get if there's a company or a person that'd be willing to do this for us. I know I don't have anybody identified and I don't, I don't think Ms. Kimmel does either. So I think the plan would be to put it out and see what we get if there's a professional company that could do this for us. Okay. All right, Councilman Brown. Thank you, uh, Vice President um, Garza. Um, to HRCS, I know that we, uh, you guys had spoke about all of the crisis is happening in Lansing, and so my question would be, are there any uh, people in HRCS working after 5 p.m. Uh, to help uh, people in Lansing when there's a crisis? Um, the late Dr. Joan Jackson Johnson, I know she was always on call. Uh, could you uh, talk about that um, as well as uh, we have 1.35% uh, of the general funds going to human services, uh, nonprofit agencies, about 60 to 70. Uh, do we have any uh, allocation or accountability to say, hey, if we're going to do these services in our city, it's supposed to be used for our, the needs of our city, have needs after five that people are going to be available to deliver those crisis services? Councilman Brown. I assure you that after five is just a time and that uh, anytime anybody has ever need to reach me with regard to anybody out there in that community, I've made myself available, whether it was after five or on the weekends. Um, and your other question with regard to uh, our contracting with agencies to help make sure that services are available after five, yes, we do. Is there a, I guess, list or is it public information? And, you know, thank you if you've been available. You're one person. So if there's crisis going on, are there, you know, employees or services available after five? And then if there are agencies, what services are provided after five so the, the people can know and be able to um, access them? Since my start here, I haven't had anything major that has occurred that required all hands on deck just yet. Um, the kinds of crises that we've dealt with after five centered around getting folks off the street when it, we had really bad weather, making certain that they were covered if they wouldn't come in. Um, we have worked with the um, street, uh, I call them PATH, street outreach uh, to assist us with services uh, with individu individuals who are in need of housing after five. We have it set up with police and fire that in the event that they encounter somebody after five that need to be housed and they can't get them in the shelter, that they can take them on to a hotel. And so we've got a system set up, uh, whereas we don't have to have all hands, or haven't had to have all hands on deck just yet after five. But in the event that there is one, we're ready. Okay, so put people in hotels. Uh, lastly, um, HRCS, I know that you guys are saying you're doing a lot of services, but I've had several complaints, you know, and I've brought them to you. With the customer experience, I really have not had constituents say, well, HRCS was such a blessing. Uh, so it's been several testimonies we've heard, you know, even here, um, as well as complaints. Is there any training uh, that you all take to how to, um, that, that you have um, for your staff to, and, and yourself as far as how to serve people, you know, who are in need or in a crisis uh, and serving people with, with dignity when they're, you know, at their most vulnerable moments? Um, so I wanted to yeah. wanted to question that. I, I appreciate that question, Councilman Brown. Um, by trade, I'm a mental health therapist, and so I understand what it means to treat people with, with respect and dignity. I know what it means to observe my staff, so if they aren't treating people with respect and dignity, I know how to approach them and ask them to make the change. So we work real hard at just that, making sure that people that come to us, we give them everything we got. Now, what they ask for may not be what we can produce which doesn't necessarily render a favorable outcome or a, a praise in a particular meeting, but I just know that we give them all we got. And I do understand that not being able to meet the needs. So there is no formal training that you guys go through. We have had campus. formal trainings, but specifically with regard to customer service, we have not gone there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm 
All right, there's a couple of questions that we've sort of gone over. So we're gonna move down to how does HRCS department um, delegate services to different nonprofit organizations? Hi, um, Kim's deferred this to me because I'm a contract manager and I work with the 60 or 70 or 80 agencies that are out in our community. Um, and um, they're a pretty am amazing group of people, I have to say. Um, they provide a wide variety of nonprofit services. Um, they are the experts um, in working in their particular areas, um, both with um, uh, just depending on what kind of service you're looking for. Um, and so the, the advantage we really have from the city perspective is that we're able to look out there and see what's out there, where are the gaps, um, and who are the people that we can tap um, in an emergency especially. Um, so that, and we, we're pretty familiar with the services that they provide so that if there's something we need that has a lot of similarity to that, we can, they can pivot quickly to create a program or expand a program that we can then hopefully um, work with them, expand or revise their contract to include. Um, so we were fortunate in, in this situation that we already had a hoteling program going. I mean, I don't consider it fortunate really, but the fact that we had it um, meant that we could respond very quickly um, so that these folks didn't have to be on the street. Um, and we felt like that was a good use of what we were doing, not that we feel like hoteling is the, the last resort um, for sheltering, but it's better than being on the street. And so that's, that's really, um, I guess, where we, our perspective is that it's best to utilize the people in the community who really have the expertise and the skills um, to address particular issues, whatever they might be. Um, we have a really wide range, as you've probably read in the past. It's on our website about all the different areas that can fall under this 1.35. Um, it's, it's a very wide scope. Um, and I just wanted to address um, Jeffrey Brown's um, concern about employability. That is something that we've been looking very closely at, and we would really like to expand um, our response from the contracts that we put out there. Um, we're very interested in um, expanding employability skills um, so we can li help uplift people. That's a priority. Okay, thank you. Council Member Spitzley and then Council Member Brown. Thank you, Madam President. Um, just briefly on that issue, I think we need to be careful. We have a financial empowerment center, and so we need to be careful that each department is doing what each department is supposed to be doing and then making sure that we're talking amongst each other because when you start merging things and, and dipping into other people's departments and, and, and zones, then that's when, that's when balls are dropped. So I, I just, I think it's great and I think we do need to do that. But again, that, that's a coordinated thing and it gets back to like the silos and we, we, we have to stop um, operating um, in silos, but I wanted to ask you, um, um, so, you know, of the 60 and 70 uh, programs um, that, that um, we provide funding to or whatever, can you talk briefly about um, how do you, what is your process to make sure that they are um, being um, appropriate fiduciaries of this money that's a pass through to them? Um, and do you um, perform auditing of their program to make sure that they are um, spending that money wisely? And, and then the second thing, so I can be done, is we are hearing, and I always like to, and I'm glad you're here, because I always like to go to the horse's mouth, but um, is there a, when you talk about hoteling, um, and, and is it, is it a referral that you guys, you, you HRCS does? Do you have a particular hotel that you work with? Because we're hearing the city of Lansing's hotel or, or HRCS, we heard that in our um, ad hoc committee on housing. And I'm, 
you know, I'm, con I'm concerned about that. I have a whole bunch of concerns about that if that is true. So, you know, what kind of auditing and follow-up are you doing to make sure that these organizations are being, you know, appropriate fiduciaries of the money that's passing through? And then the second thing is for hoteling, you know, does the city of Lansing have a hotel that they, you know, that there is their go-to or they, you know, they, they put people in versus any other place? Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. You're welcome. I'll do the first one. If you want to do this one. Um, I can answer the first question, and then I'll defer to my boss for the second one. Um, so um, in the instance of monitoring and overseeing oversight of the grants, um, we have a quarterly reporting process for each of the agencies. Um, so, um, but before they even get a contract, we do a capacity review where we look at, you know, what is their past experience, including fiduciary and um, financial. Um, we ask to look at, you know, any of, we have a whole list of documents <laughs> that we review before they are um, contracted with. Um, and then once they do have the contract, um, so we want them to be, you know, a good stable organization. Um, that the city feels comfortable contracting with in the first place. Then the next thing is that we have a quarterly reporting process. So we ask them to turn in reports on a regular basis. We review those. We get back with people if we think there's slow spending or too much spending and then how are you going to keep this program going all year because we contracted with you for a year term and that sort of thing. So, and then we share information with each other. I bring issues to um, Director Coleman, um, and then we can, um, we do have termination clauses in our contract. And when have you, when is the last time you've terminate, terminated someone for inaction? If you, if you don't know, that's fine. I'm just yeah, curious. Yeah, I'm trying to, sorry. I'm, so, yeah, okay, I'm so not, not recently, certain. right? Um, it Hello? seems like, it seems like that we did end some contracts not that long ago, but I'm, I'm unfortunately not not pulling up which ones they were. I, I don't need we've specifics, done, but you yeah, you are saying that you you have you have eliminated. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Were you done, Councilmember Spitz? Oh, yeah. I'm, and as for ahead. your second question, no. yep. Uh, I'm hoteling sorry. begin. Uh, I'm sorry. Should I proceed? Hoteling. So proceed, please. Began my with, fault. Uh, began with the pandemic when we needed to separate people who were ill. Uh, from other folks in the shelters. Um, many of the shelters were, uh, had established relationships with a number of hotels that were willing to reduce their expense uh, and, and, and allow those folks to stay there. Um, Advent House Ministry was one of them. And so Advent House Ministry works with, I think it's about three hotels um, that she's assisted us with doing the placement for. So we don't reach out to the hotels directly at all. It's a part of our contract for emergency shelter. Mm -hmm. Okay, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Council President. Um, out of the, uh, thank you for your testimony today. Out of the 60, 70 agencies, um, and today we talked about kind of having a sign and return form policies where it's not really verified. So out of the agencies, um, you're getting the documents and reports on a quarterly basis. Uh, but how uh, many uh, or how often are you going and doing site visits and following up with the actual recipients of service to do like a survey and check to see if they actually got services and what the quality of services was um, versus, you know, just what they're providing to you saying here. This I need to interrupt you for a second. Uh, apparently we're getting word that city TV is down. So the people in the back if um, it's not up if we could take a look at that. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilmember Brown. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry to have been interrupted. Oh, no problem. Uh, versus, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, versus, um, you know, just taking their report saying, well, we serve, you know, 30 people and so we, we deserve the money. Um, you made a reference to a, uh, um, a procedure that EDP uses, so, but I'm, I didn't quite understand okay. that reference because okay. that isn't our, I mean, that's not. 
So I, I apologize. So let me explain it a different way. Um, you indicated that you have agencies that sign um, up through an application process to deliver a service. Uh, the nonprofit, you said about 60 or 70. Then you said on a quarterly basis, they provide reports to indicate and that they delivered the service and producing the outcome that we contracted them for. What I'm asking is, are you all doing actual site visits? When is the last time on the agencies and talking with the actual constituents or customers receiving the service to determine that it was actually delivered and done with quality and dignity? Um, we would do that more on a, um, a basis of if someone, if you know of an agency and you think there's a concern, we might go out there and follow that up. Um, we do do monitoring annually of different agencies. It's a sampling, um, and it's also a, we think we need to get out to this one because we have some red flags um, that have, um, you know, presented themselves. So, so uh, we do it, so we do it annually, okay. but we don't go to every single agency annually because we're not able to do that with our current staffing. Um, obviously, COVID sort of threw a wrench into some of that, um, but I, you know, but I definitely pursued some of that anyway um, through uh, phones and virtual kind of things. Um, so yeah, so monitoring does happen, um, and we ask people for uh, sign-in sheets and that sort of thing to show their documentation of uh, numbers and such. Um, so we use different methods like that. So to, you don't have a to do it. Oh. We have not done. We haven't gone in and done a survey of participants. Mm -hmm. um, that would be difficult okay. to conduct. But we could we could pursue some ideas about how we might be able to do a sampling sort of thing um, because they don't give us their names necessarily. We don't go away. We don't require them to give us the names of the people they serve. Um, as a confidentiality measure. Um, but if we look at a list, of course, I'm looking at a list of names and that sort of thing, but I don't take copies um, with me. Um, but if you have some thoughts about doing participant surveys for each of these agencies, we do expect them to conduct those and we expect them to provide us with feedback um, and sort of results of summaries. So. Well, thank you. I, I don't think that agencies, if they have complaints, are going to report them to you. So it seems like oh, complaints actually they they should be reporting complaints to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, but you're holding them to if they're a bad actor to provide you with bad information to get the funding, which is a conflict of interest to get the funding taken. Yeah, potentially. Um, but usually, you know, people. This is not that big of a town. People talk. Um, things. Information gets back to us. So I've had several, you know, and I've, we've talked before this meeting tonight about several constituents complaining on agency providers. And so it sounds like you guys don't have a policy, which I would suggest that you visit and do annual site visits on yeah. these agencies. We, we are um, doing that. As well as it's very, um, it's, um, I wish it was different as a resident of Lansing that we do not reach out and talk to anyone getting help to figure out from their mouth what the truth is and what they're experiencing. Okay. Um, oh. are, are you done? Um, I was also gonna ask uh, quickly with Barb, um, when is the last time that we have done code uh, inspection on these hotels that we're sending people to? C code doesn't do inspections of hotels. Fire marshal does. Fire marshal. So that's a question that to the fire marshal. Yeah, to the fire marshal. So if we can get that, I don't know. Okay. Somebody. Okay, uh, Council Member Kloss. Thank you, President Wood. <clears throat> Real quick, um, we were talking about hoteling. Do you know statistically how many people are turned away per week from the hoteling program? No, that information was not given to me um, recently. But I, what I will tell you, tell you is that we have prioritized uh, with regard to the people who are hoteled, 
with hopes of freeing up some of the room and some of the shelters for others. And so our priorities for hotels would be families with children, it would be seniors, and it would be individuals with special needs and or those who are medically fragile. And so we are reaching out and making sure that those, that vulnerable population is, is taken care of with hopes that individuals uh, would have a better chance at securing a space in one of the shelters. So in the beginning, we weren't getting folks turned away because she was helping as many folks as she could who met that criteria. Because funding has been used and is now uh, rather low, um, we're having to have the approvals through us. And even still, we've not turned anybody away that I'm aware of. So you, you're saying that no one has been turned away from the hotel program? That I'm aware of. Joe, would you agree with that assessment? Uh, as far as I know, correct, yes. Okay. Um, I spent three months with the gentleman that I had to call um, Advent House and make a personal plea to get him in um, because he was turned away by your department, just, just an FYI. Um, we just got him housed um, through generous donations for his deposit um, from folks. Um, and he needed help, and we gave it to him. So. Um, I just want to make that point clear. Um, did anyone at this table here um, go to the 1317 Kalamazoo inspection where the people from the 2222 Home Street were shuffled to? No. I went to, I was at 2222 two West Home Street uh, on three different occasions. And I wanted to also clarify, LPD social workers joined me there as well. I was there Thursday morning with Barb and Shelby, but I did want to make sure that, uh, you know, our process of working with LPD social workers, that's a, a real a real thing. And so I did want to make that clear. I mean. Uh, Thanks, so. Joe. So you, no one was at 1317 Kalamazoo for the inspection? No, that there was okay. up for an inspection. So who, who, when, we need, when we had to figure out that these people had no place to go because it was pink tagged, um, did anybody call either um, um, Director Coleman or Joe, did, did either of you call Advent House to make these arrangements? Yes, yes, we were there. I was there all day Friday, not at, not at Kalamazoo, but at, at West Holmes to make sure that nobody was gonna be left there over the weekend, so. Okay, I'm because I'm confused, because Barb, weren't you on the phone with yeah, I, Advent House making arrangements? Okay. Yes, I, I don't know if I called Advent House directly or Kim Coleman. I can't. I believe that. If I, can, if I can clarify, yeah. Advent House and I spoke, and she couldn't reach, and so I gave her Barb's direct number because she needed specifics about the people who were, who were displaced. Got, and so okay. we we were very much involved in this, Councilman. Okay. Well, and I was too. You know, full time job. I was there at the inspection. Mm -hmm. It was deplorable. So, thank you for clarifying. Okay, um, our next question is, how are the residents notified of unsafe housing conditions? So if, if we tag an occupied property, then the residents are told by the code enforcement officer of the conditions and that they must vacate and then they're provided with the resources as well um, that we discussed and um, and then also a letter is mailed to the homeowner, the property owner, and a letter is mailed to the tenant as well. Okay. All right, our next question is, when does HRCS engage with residents of unsafe housing conditions to assist them? I think we've um, had answers on that already okay our next one is uh, why are we openly discriminating against single males in hoteling I've heard several times that we don't have money to help males with singles that are singles with a dog uh, is that not illegal and um, do they not deserve to live they do not deserve to live under a bridge. I agree. And if I can 
add, there are no gender specific programs or services being offered by the HRCS. As I indicated earlier to you with regard to the priority of those people being hoteled, that's how that's being managed. Okay. Uh, we've got three more questions. Regarding uh, 2222 homes, what outreach was done with the residents from the time the units were first inspected until they were red tagged? So by that question, I, I don't understand. Uh, I, because I think when we inspected that day, we red tagged them, but I think you're referring to before they became red tagged. Some of those units were pink tagged, um, you know, and right. then there Some was the reports were... that the property owners were putting millions of dollars into the buildings and nothing happened, and right. then they eventually were red tagged. I right. think that's the yeah. essence. I can't answer that because I don't know. I can tell you that when building safety tagged the building, um, the team and I met with the residents that were present and we explained that the building had been deemed unsafe and that they could not say, stay there overnight um, uh, and they couldn't live there until the building was made safe. At that time, SimTab assured us that they would move all residents to, unsafe, or to safe housing units, um, which we found out later that they didn't do. Uh, we explained to SimTab that residents could not immediately be moved. Um, they, we explained to them that if residents couldn't immediately be moved, that they needed to be hoteled because the building was unsafe to occupy. Um, the code enforcement officer, Tom Barry, was there with us on site along with several building safety personnel and the fire marshal. And Tom Barry provided all the residents with the, with the resource brochures. Um, and upon leaving the building, we notified HRCS and also notified the mayor's office and also notified um, uh, Adam and President Wood, and then later in the day, notified the entire council. Uh, uh, council Member Spitzley, and then Council Member um, Hussein. Thank you, Madam President. I think we're missing a step here. So, for me, um, there's a time for the pink tag to the red tag. So, you know, and I guess, you know, this is hindsight, but I think we needed it for clarity's sake. What was that time span between code enforcement pink tagging it to code enforcement red tagging it? I ask because I walk by there almost every day. Right. So and I walked by there in the summertime mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and made calls about the trash and the construction material. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm trying to wonder, because we don't want it to get to red tag. So there's a whole span to me of things that can be done before it absolutely gets to red tag. So I'm wondering what that time span was. Right. So first of all, let me explain to you that that building was not pink tagged. That building had a valid certificate that was issued in June of 2022. And my understanding of the events was that the roof started leaking in November and continued to leak and leak and leak and that the building owners pulled a permit in January, but work on the roof did not start until the day that we showed up out there with building safety. Surprise, so surprise. that roof leaked openly for months. So, to the th point, so that is, that is correct. Point, right, to the point where garden level unit ceilings fell in yeah, yeah. because the water was leaking so bad, water was running inside the walls. It was absolutely terrible condition. Some of the units were red tagged. There were a portion of the units that were red tagged, um, but a lot of the units were still occupied. So Barb, and I know that you're, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna kind of put, I'm gonna jump in here because, you know, the roof flew off during that high wind time. Remember the, that roof flew off, the roof at Jolly Road flew off. So I remember when the, when the roof flew off on there. But I gotta tell you, and, and you know, that before that, they were red tagged at, mm -hmm. at one point, and I don't know if they were taken up, the tags were taken off. I don't know what happened, but they were red tagged before that. But again, 
you know, and, and, and you, know, not, you know, when I'm calling code, when you're calling code, uh, there's, there's just a disconnect. And so that roof and that, you know, construction material, and we, 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 I know I called, so I can imagine that you called. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's it. there, and, and we're calling, and, we're, and so there's no follow-up. Or if there is, nobody's coming back and saying, Councilmember Spitzley, I was out there. You know, we talked to them. They, we've got a plan on how to address it. And so that's where I'm getting at is how do we get to here because there's a whole bunch of steps in between there that I'm hoping that you guys are going to be looking at, you and Shelby are going to be looking at to, to make sure that we're doing a whole bunch of stuff before we get to the point where we have to rehouse people. Right. That's, I agree with you 100%. That is something that needs to be taken into consideration very seriously because we don't ever want to do that again. That was a terrible thing to see people living in those conditions. Uh, Council Member um, Hussein. No, you actually took the words out of my mouth. So it, what, what is really concerning to me is that the roof blew off in November. Yeah. Um, and so blew off in November. Um, we had, that came on the heels of, you know, a number of us and tenants bringing a number of issues um, to, you know, who we thought um, were, were supposed to be out in the field doing the work. Uh, we had, you know, the permits that had been finaled. Uh, we had, you know, even prior to all of this, um, we had, uh, uh, cert certificates that have been issued that probably should have never been issued uh, because of the condition of this property, right? This did not happen overnight. We keep saying that. Um, and so I, I was going to get to the timeline and discuss the fact that we have got to make sure that we actually have a process in place that we're able to apply with fidelity uh, because that, I cannot believe, again, the roof blew off in November. And here we are in April and they still don't have a roof. Um, so, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a problem. It's an absolute failure of the system. Okay, um, our next question uh, would be to the administration, to the mayor. What have you done administratively to combat this issue? Well, we're doing a, an up and down review. You're, everything you're hearing right here from, from Barb, from Shelby, from Kim and, and Joe and Tony, um, we are looking at this department top and bottom, code compliance to see what's, what needs to change what uh, um, what were the failures? What are the good things that are going on? And um, we're you know we're going to explore all of it. We, we put Shelby, who's the chief strategy officer, into this to to dive down deep into it. We're going to get the staffing and personnel right. We're going to make sure that the processes work. We'll um, we will recommend changes that we think council needs to make if there's any. We'll make you know you heard everything from Barb. Is certainly we're listening to all of your ideas and thoughts and. Those will all go on the list, and if there's anybody here at council that has, you know, ordinance changes that you want to share with me, I'm happy to, to take a look as well, and I look forward to working with you on that. So, we're doing a top to bottom review, and I think that looking at the system and making sure we have an effective system moving forward is what we can do to make sure that um, that we are on top of these these issues. I I think um, a a couple of things. One. Um, I appreciate your comments, um, but I think we need to make sure that we have some type of timeline so that we're able to judge and be able to understand whether we are making progress or not. Um, that That's extremely important. And um, again, having sat in a number of meetings with you last year when some of these same issues were um, discussed, I think, if anything, we should have all learned that um, we can't assume that things are being done. Um, there was evidence that there were things that needed to be corrected that didn't get corrected. And if we're going to make progress on this and move in the right direction, we have to make sure that we're doing the checks and balances. and that and that we're having some type of accountability. Council Member um, Brown. Um, Thank you. You're next. Uh, that was the actual word you ended on was, was my question, Mayor. Uh, accountability seems like it's at the forefront of a lot of these issues. Uh, is there any reason that there's never been any employee evaluations to hold employees and staff accountable? Under we, your leadership? We do them with, uh, with I do them with department directors. I do, I do, um, 
annual uh, meetings and conversations, evaluations with them. In terms of the employees, I have to look into our CBAs and talk to our uh, our union folks, our union representatives, on why that would have been removed in contracts in the past. And I mean, it's time consuming. It's it's uh, it is challenging when you have 900 employees and and. Uh, but supervisors, I know we have some supervisors in some departments that will evaluate and, and do annual reviews and things like that. But in terms of an official, here's the form that everyone uses, we don't have a centralized form. So I do it with my department directors uh, every December. And um, I, we just don't have anything standardized that, um, and that's something we can certainly collectively bargain. We all deal with the, the contracts and we can add that to a contract if that's something that's interested. Um, but it's worth talking to different department directors to see how they and their supervisors interact with their employees for review every year. Councilmember Hussein. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm still just absolutely stunned that we don't have evaluations. We talk about as an example with code compliance. Um, we have, we are promoting people from premise to code. We're promoting people from code to lead housing. We're promoting people from lead housing inspector to co-compliance manager. How are we doing that if we have no evaluations? Um, if we, you know, and, and even when we look at our districts as an example, and, uh, and we try to come up with effectiveness, and, and we try to come up with, uh, you know, in, intra-departmental um, you know, policy change, we have, we have no idea in terms of time on task. We have no idea in terms, we, I mean, how do you put a PIP or an IDP together? Uh, for, yeah, I mean, you don't. So how do you ever, that's, that's professionally, part of, how do you ever professionally grow in these departments without evaluations? I don't understand. I mean, it's part of the job of our supervisors. Our supervisors are there to supervise and review and evaluate. But, that hasn't been, but I, I'm not certain that that's been happening. And so oh, if that's right. not been happening, then it becomes the job of the people at the top to hold supervisors accountable. Our, our supervisors are doing, are they doing annual, you know, evaluations, one form evaluations? I, I, I hate to interrupt you, Mayor, but if they were supervising, we wouldn't be where we are today. Well, but we're talking about, you're talking about everything throughout the city. We have one department where we have issues that we are reviewing. We have many, many, we have 13 departments with lots of different pieces moving, and, and you all know that. In this one case, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. But if you want to talk about the city in general, we do have some very good supervisors that review their employees and what they do, um, and, it, and it works. In this case, we have issues, and we are evaluating it top to bottom, and we are moving forward with, new, with procedures and policies that we haven't had before. Okay. Um, I want Council, Council Member Spitz. Not to belabor the point, but, but the issue is if you don't have um, formal evaluations of your employees and an employee if there is misconduct or whatever and you let that employee go you are opening yourself up to litigation and lawsuits each and every time because that employee doesn't know why they've been let go and so they assume so they assume that it's X Y and Z because there is no record no performance appraisal, no performance review. I was chief of legal for the Department of Natural Resources, you know, thousands of employees. And it's not a collective bargaining thing. It's an administrative thing. And, and, and again, this is just for me that, and I would have never brought it up, but the fact of the matter is, if you're not having annual performance appraisals, you can't fire anybody because you haven't what are, you, what are you comparing their behavior against? You can't promote anybody because what are you, what are you comparing their behavior against? And so, you know, it's, it's I'm not saying that, I, I think we have great people, so don't get me wrong. We have great people in the city of Lansing. They are dedicated, frontline employees, but everybody needs an appraisal, an annual appraisal to stay on task and to set them up for promotions. If I don't have an appraisal and you get a promotion, I'm thinking something. And then the next thing I'm going to be doing is calling somebody to sue because I feel I should have got a promotion over you because there's nothing there to say, well, Jeff did X, Y, and Z, and Patricia, uh, you didn't quite meet the cut. So that, I think that's what we're talking about here. Um, so. Thank you. Um, at, at this time, was your hand up or were you distracted? Okay. At, at this time, I want to first of all thank 
all the employees that were here this evening to answer these questions. I want to thank council members who took it out of their time to be here for this special uh, committee of a whole that started at 5.30 and we're now almost 9 o'clock. So I appreciate that tremendously. This is an extremely important issue. There were a number of things that came up as part of this discussion. And what I'd like to do is we're going to pass um, this on to Public Safety Committee. And we're going to ask the Public Safety Committee do a committee report once a month uh, to keep us informed at council as to where things are and the timelines and the, and the different issues that have come up. Um, one of the last questions was, um, what ordinances do we need city council uh, to uh, do to end this cycle? And that will be part of, again, uh, the information and the things that uh, you're dealing with, Councilmember Hussein, at this time. So I would recommend that you take a look at the, the, the red tag ordinance. Yeah. One of the issues that we have had in the past, and I think Barb relayed this, is when we red tag, you have to have people out immediately that day. Um, Kim and, and uh, Brian McGrain had a process where when we were going in to evaluate, we, we needed to give time so that Kim could get people rehoused, people could get rehoused. Um, but with the, or with the red tag ordinance, there's no option. It's, as soon as it's red tagged, they are, they are evicted. Um, so I don't know if there's the ability to have a grace period where we can take the time to relocate people from the day that it's red tagged to the day that they are displaced. Um, that is an ordinance issue. Um, and again, we tried, to, we tried to navigate that by not necessarily red tagging immediately, but that's basically putting off the ability to say you're in bad housing. So I hope you all will take a look at that. Um, and certainly, I know Kim is, is uh, interested, I'm sure Barb and Shelby as well, and working with you, it's just one small piece. But in terms of not making people homeless, you know, on the same day they find out that they're living in a red tagged house because it was red tagged, that is an important piece of of the the compassion and the grace that was asked for by several of the council members. All right, Council Member Hussein. Just very quickly, then first of all, uh, public safety president. committee right now uh, meets the uh, second and fourth uh, Tuesdays, uh, three thirty, tenth uh, floor. Of, of City Hall, if people want to be engaged uh, in that work, we certainly will take that up on a bi-weekly basis, then we'll, um, I'm sorry, first and third. First and third. First and third, I'm getting committee uh, meetings mixed up. Um, so first and third, I apologize. Uh, but that is uh, Councilwoman Wood, myself, uh, and Council Member Cost, uh, so I know we, um, we are eager for the opportunity to continue to, to research this, but, but really, again, being solution-oriented, come up with, um, with um, obviously, uh, coordination with our administration, our city uh, attorney's office, but come up with some real solutions um, when we start to get after this issue. Um, that being said, we have um, a, a young lady in the uh, um, audience, sorry, uh, Rosalind Williams, who um, has had a number of issues. Um, I know you know. Um, she has tried to work, I think, in earnest with folks um, within our uh, HRCS, and maybe even economic development and planning, and potentially even, co uh, I'm sorry, law. Um, I'm going to ask you personally that before she leaves tonight, she sat here through the duration of this meeting that you actually personally connect with her tonight. Um, and just to hear uh, the concerns, uh, the issues that she's dealing with, what her experience has been, uh, she tried, she's trying to navigate the bureaucracy here, um, and, and I'm hoping you can come up with some solutions with your team. Thank you. Vice President Garza. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so I don't, I'm not sure if we can uh, change the ordinance regarding the red tag issue in case if it's a, a health safety issue. You know, I'd hate to be, you know, accountable for some, someone getting, you know, hurt or possibly die in that situation. However, I don't know if we can implement some more accountability regarding the code enforcement officers for not following up. Because, I mean, there's been plenty of uh, apartment buildings in the city of Lansing that went into a red, red tag status after a year or so of not being not following up by certain code officials so i mean i'm hoping that you guys can put some kind of procedure in place to follow up with the code enforcement officers if there's a uh, an issue at a property and it's not followed up and then it ends up going into a red tag state status a year later i mean you should never even get to that point i mean we should make sure we hold our uh, code enforcement officers or whoever it is accountable okay is that it all right, with that, we are adjourned.